Hello everyone. Welcome to the channel. So, it's been over a year. Sorry about that. Lots been going on in the game and outside of it. I'll go over a few little things before we start, but if you already know the format and just want to get into it, skip ahead to this time where we start properly. Some of you watching will probably be new as I've been quiet for a while. This is a series where we take a look at every vehicle in depth, we work out its strengths and weaknesses, and from there talk about how best to play it, and then decide whether it's worth getting, considering, or avoiding for use in your lineups. Just from my perspective, of course. It's just my take on things. This video has changed a lot over the last year I've been working on it. Some of the audio may be a bit different as I've recorded the voiceover in I think four different rooms, so sorry if it's a bit inconsistent. And sorry it's taken so long. There's been a lot of changes in the game over the last year, so I've had to change parts of the video around quite a bit. And also, I had something unfortunate happen to me last year, which has meant I've lost a bit of vision in my right eye. So that hasn't helped gameplay. Sorry if it's not as sharp. But still, I hope the video is enjoyable. And on that note, thank you for being here. And as always, I really hope you enjoy. So, starting off today, feels weird saying that again we have the M551 Sheridan, which marks quite a big jump in technology from the previous tier. This is the point in the game where the fundamentals of vehicles change. There are some exceptions to this, but at the start of rank 6 and around 8.0 is where a lot of new technologies appear almost all at once. So making a good start into rank 6 is important, as there's a lot of new things to learn quite abruptly. And despite not inherently being an entirely lacklustre vehicle, the Sheridan isn't the best introduction to this new game style. At its core, it absolutely is a light tank. Armour and survivability are barely worth touching on. Even weak autocannons can shred you. You're even weak to heavy machine guns in some spots. Survivability can be passively improved somewhat if you stay hull down. If you take 26 out of the 30 rounds you have available, there'll be no ammo in the turret. It of course still has no armour and if you get hit with anything chemical you're out, but you can survive the odd kinetic shot into the turret. So, as far as staying alive for as long as possible, hull down at range is the best you've got. Mobility and responsiveness are really good here. Once spaded, you can cruise off-road at 40 kph comfortably. You can reach your absolute max speed of 68 plus 1 kph on roads, but most maps don't have a stretch of straight road long enough for you to reach this. You'll probably end up in the 50s before being slowed down by a turn. Although the mobility boost is significant enough to make it important to prioritise roads for a good early game position. On top of this, it's a very reactive tank as well. You have neutral steering and can turn and accelerate nicely. On a good crew too, you'll have a turret traverse speed in the high 30s, so it really isn't lacking in this regard. It also has a full stabiliser. Much like the Sherman's, the gun is stable on the move, but completely this time. Even at max speed, the gun stays steady. At this battle rating, stabs become very common, so it's not a huge advantage, relatively speaking, but having one is vital for a vehicle like this. Armament is a bit more tricky, though. Light tanks generally come with lower caliber cannons with a fast fire rate. This works pretty well for them, as the mobility lets them get to flanking positions where the comparatively weaker guns won't struggle with frontal armor. The Sheridan though changes this entirely, in a way that's quite unique but not necessarily effective. It comes equipped with a 152mm cannon. Currently a bit of a first for the US here. As unlike other nations, the US only has a couple of high caliber tanks in the game. The Sheridan comes equipped with stock HE and heat. The heat shell can get through 380mm of armor, which is fairly impressive if you just look at the big number. Even though it's a big shell, it doesn't create a huge jet of damage. It's still quite condensed and will get caught on fuel tanks and tracks, drastically reducing its potential. It will reliably set off ammo though when hit, so if you know where ammo is on what you're fighting, it's a good spot to aim for. If not though, the heat is much more reliable at taking out crew. If ammo is at the back on the vehicle that you hit, sometimes the heat won't have enough energy to set it off after passing through the front of the tank. But any crew in the way of the jets will get taken out, so also go for these shots where applicable. A lot of tanks at this battle rating have crew in a line, 
which makes one-shots quite possible with this approach. The HE round similarly is not hugely reliable but still situationally workable. It's not as powerful as some of the more legendary heat slingers like the KV-2 and the Brumbar though. It actually has exactly half the explosive filler of the Brumbar's HE shell. But with a good shot, you can one-shot a lot of tanks. If you land this round underneath an enemy, or the bottom of a turret, or hit something on the roof, it usually will destroy it. But if you miss even slightly, you'll likely not be dealing any substantial damage, which is usually how it goes with this round. As one-on-one -on -one engagements at this BR happen much faster due to the high pen guns and full stabilizers, you often lack the time to aim for these weak spots. You have no armor and everything you fight knows this. So while you're adjusting your aim to find the right spot to land the shell, they've already clicked on you. Of course, depending on the player you're fighting, you can win in a situation like this, but it isn't a reliable enough strategy most of the time. Almost every contemporary kinetic round travels twice as fast as yours, so you are at a natural disadvantage here. The Sheridan also lacks any kind of rangefinder, so sniping with this round is not impossible, but definitely not reliable. It's hard to aim accurately, and with the reload being longer than almost every other enemy you'll fight, it's not the point-and-click cannon it may look like on the surface. Some tanks can be very reliably taken out with the HE though where the heat may fail, so I'd still take some HE rounds to switch to. But there's one more ammo type left, a munition that we haven't seen before. The Sheridan can fire guided missiles. These are effectively heat rounds that you can control in flight with your cursor. At tier 2, you can unlock the Shillelagh ATGM. It has 51mm more penetration than the heat shell at 431 flat. Something to note though is that the gameplay that features ATGMs may look a bit inconsistent. I've been getting footage for this video for a while, and the last update changed how ATGMs perform. Now, specifically for the Sheridan, they have a small dip and then control as normal. Overall, they are less responsive and more sensitive. They oscillate to try and correct their course, which at long range, if you're trying to track something moving laterally, it can make accuracy very poor. Which is a shame, as beforehand they were really quite good and made the Sheridan a lot more reliable. So I don't delay this video any longer, I will still have clips of the old ATGMs, but just know that they currently look and feel a bit different. Although I suppose it does add some contrast of what they used to be like. Also, as this is a very recent change, it is possible that the missiles will be altered again. We will look at the Sheridan as it currently is with the current missile functionality it has, but it may be the case that it changes again in the future. I do have a feeling that the way they're currently performing is slightly bugged. The missile behaves differently in live games than it does in custom battles and the test drive, so there may be some server-related issues that's incidentally messing with its accuracy. I can't really say. So, aside from these changes, the main hard disadvantage of this missile is that it actually has a longer reload than the regular shells you have access to, 20 seconds stock compared to the 15.6 of the main shells. From what I remember, this is a mechanic only present for the shillelagh, and it sort of feels unnecessary now. If we want to be pedantic, there are plenty of shells in this game that could also reasonably have the same reload difference by a similar logic. Back when this change happened with the shillelagh, ATGMs were much more dominant, but now that they've fallen off a bit, it does seem like a nerf that isn't really justified by its performance. If not in the game already, I don't think this mechanic would have been introduced today. Anyway though, the reload difference is something to keep in mind. It has its place in realism, but seems a bit too excessive from a gameplay perspective. So, how do we play it? It's difficult for the Sheridan, as it doesn't really have a universal environment that maximizes its advantages at every turn. It's a very map-dependent vehicle. There's a lot of things you can do, but with limited reliability. The way I used to play this one most of the time was to main the ATGM at long range. You can still do this, the Shillelagh isn't unusable by any means, but it is a lot less consistent. Long range in general does have merits though. It ensures that you're in a position that maximizes your survivability, making you harder to hit and giving you more time to guide in the ATGM. It does have a limited max range at just over 3km, but this is fine for effectively every map. 
Another further limitation is that you can only carry 10 missiles max, but most of the time, by the point that you've spent all these missiles, the game has progressed to a point where sniping at range is no longer a viable approach. To continue having a meaningful impact on the match, you'll have to push up, so it's hardly a tangible limitation. Something else that can help you in this position is another tool we haven't mentioned yet. Light vehicles in rank 6 and above get access to a light scout UAV. Once unlocked, you can launch it and scout out the area from the sky. This is most useful when playing in a squad with friends though. However, you can still use it solo to scout out the area and see where enemy vehicles are coming from. I don't find myself using it too much, it certainly isn't something I activate by default, but if there's a lull in the match where I know an enemy is around but not exactly where, I'll launch the drone to find where it is. You can also set up a key to mark a spot for your team, which also lets you pinpoint exactly where an enemy is, which is nice and useful. It's a good tool to have, but make sure you only use it while in cover, and only when you can afford to. It is tempting to overuse something like this, so don't let it slow down your advance to a good position. Speaking of good positions, if I'm on a map that is more suited to the ATGM, the spot I usually go for is one that covers a wide sightline that lets me stay mostly in cover. Engaging over a wide area gives you more room to control your ATGM, and less room for your enemy to react and hide. Not all maps have this though, but in general, look for a spot around mid to long range. As the Sheridan is decently mobile, you can get yourself to a spot like this early in the match no problem, and can back away to re-engage if you get pinned down. Also, try and position in locations that are on the flatter side. You only have 8 degrees of gun depression, which isn't terrible, but because the Sheridan is small, it effectively needs to crest more to fire over defilades so try and avoid steep cover. You can play like this, but with the missile currently, I wouldn't recommend it as a priority. Because of the missile oscillation, you can sometimes miss an otherwise easy target at long range, which with a long reload really hurts and doesn't lead to rewarding gameplay. If you want to use the missile currently, just try to make your movements as gentle as possible. If you have line of sight on your target, aim slightly above them to compensate for the dip, and then guide in gently. I found it's much less sensitive to vertical correction than horizontal correction, so be careful when tracking something moving. The Sheridan can also work aggressively too though, and in its current state, this is where I've been having the most success with it. If I'm fighting at close range, generally I will main the heat round. The missile currently isn't as usable here. Because of the dip and the lower responsiveness, it's very easy to miss at close range. So, I would avoid using it here if you're engaging within around 500 meters. Although, if you are caught with it, if you fire slightly upwards above the tank you're fighting, you can compensate for the dip somewhat, but it's still hard to be reliably accurate. Despite not being the most reliable, the heat does work here. The reload is faster and the shell travels quicker, which does let you stay a bit more aggressive. But here, you do need to aim very accurately. Ironically, it's usually the large caliber guns that can afford to be less accurate, but you do need to be very precise with this one due to the long reload and unreliable damage. At close range, you can't afford to not cripple your enemy with your first shot. Not destroying them outright is already bad, as you're probably going to spend over 25 seconds taking out a single enemy. If they can fire back, or even if they just have a 50 cal, they'll be able to take you out easily. So, if you're at close range and not confident with ammo placement, aim to disable your enemy's ability to fire as a priority. It's always best to go for the one shot, but better play it safe sometimes if you're not completely sure. Something else to keep in mind is that your gun elevation is really slow at only 4 degrees a second. So, make sure that if you are rolling around at close range, you're keeping your cannon aimed level with where enemies are likely to appear from. Another disadvantage to close range is the nature of most urban environments. There's a lot of soft cover all over, from small bushes to fences. You only have chemical rounds, so it's very easy to clip your shell into cover like this and do no damage. You can use your 50 cal to take down some kinds of cover, but in general I would avoid maps like this. 8.0 is a great lineup, and you have options that perform better here, but you can still play around this area. Not all urban maps are off-limits though. Mostly it's locations like Poland that have a lot of fences. The more labyrinth-like maps like Breslau can actually be quite good for it. 
maps that have a lot of branching pathways into the map itself are really good for vehicles like this, as you have more opportunities to use your mobility to push down one of the less travelled pathways to flank an ambush. It's still risky with the reload, but still viable. Just try to avoid the main lanes. The flanks are also a possibility, but you do need to be careful. Your mobility definitely lets you fight here, and the stabilizer helps with reaction times, but the reload can definitely catch you out. And it is possible to land a shot square in the side of an enemy and do very little damage if it hits empty space or a track. I would only play this way if you're confident with ammo placement as you need to go for those one-shots. If in doubt though, aim under or into the side of the turret. Pros. Good mobility. And the cons. Poor survivability. Long reload. And unreliable firepower. What's our verdict? I will have to start with an avoid it here. I used to like the Sheridan quite a lot, but after the missile changes, it has lost a lot of versatility. It can still work at close and long range, but has tangible drawbacks in each situation, so there's never really an ideal spot for it. And as you have a pretty full 8.0 lineup, it hurts this thing even more. Since the Sheridan doesn't excel distinctly in any situation, there's rarely any need to choose it over the other options you have access to. What made the Sheridan so good was a controllable missile you can fire on the move. Once that controllability has been drastically reduced, it's forced to play more at close range. And in up tiers, which are quite common, in this environment you're kind of outmatched by everything. Enemies that are faster, have better survivability, more reliable ammo, faster reloads, there's just not much of a place for this thing currently. If the missiles become more reliable again, I would say it's probably worth considering, but right now it's just not very enjoyable or effective. Next up, another light vehicle at 8.0 that's almost completely different. This is the M3 Bradley, a very recognisable light tank. I know the proper designation is CFV, Cavalry Fighting Vehicle, but I will just be sticking with calling it a light tank, as within the scope of the game, that's what it functions as. Mobility-wise, the Bradley and Sheridan are close. The Bradley is heavier, but has a more powerful engine, and ultimately wins out. It's a bit quicker to accelerate, and can cruise at a higher top speed off-road. Its top speed potential is slightly slower on-road, but as it accelerates faster, it often holds a higher speed than the Sheridan here as well. The reverse speed is practically the same too. Turret Traverse is great though. On a stock crew, you're already at 42 degrees a second, which lets you aim at tanks nice and quickly. Protection is barely a factor. You can't survive against any conventional rounds. At mid-range, the German 20mm autocannons on the Marder and similar vehicles will take a bit of time to find your weak spots, but that's really the best you've got. So it's not worth breaking down much further. Just assume that you're vulnerable to everything. Firepower, though, is again pretty interesting, at least in terms of what we've seen so far. The Bradley has a primary 25mm autocannon, as well as two ATGM launchers. The autocannon is not hugely impressive frontally, but for what it is, it's pretty good. It has a max pen of 81mm, and retains enough penetration at mid-range and angles to reliably deal with light vehicles and weaker MBTs. And really, that's all you need. In all situations, you can defeat tanks with poor protection. There are tanks you can't really deal with frontally though, notably Russian and Chinese stuff, but the weaker tanks you can always deal with. The cannon is also stabilised, but the fire rate is quite low. Not as bad as the Warrior, but nearly three times slower than the BMP-2. It doesn't matter too much, as a few well-placed shots will disable a tank if you can pen it, but against an enemy that's stabilised or has an autocannon themselves, you need to make sure those first few shots land accurately. So try to aim for the gunner first. The 25 comes with two rounds, a high explosive round and the main Sabo round. The stock belt is 1 to 1, so until you get the main Sabo belt at 3 to 1, you do need to be extra careful on landing that first shot. The autocannon is effective, but you still have the twin launcher. So, sadly, I will have to talk about these in a more disconnected way. Right now, they're even less usable than the missiles on the Sheridan. After around a thousand meters or so, 
they try to correct themselves at distance to the point where the corrections the missile makes are large enough to entirely miss your target. I still feel like these will definitely be improved. So it's an annoying situation at the moment. Because things in this game change constantly, there'll always be fluctuations. And if I were to try and account for everything I think will be changed in the future, I'll just be delaying this video forever, basically. So, like the Sheridan, we will look at the Bradley taking into account its current performance. But I will also go through the specifics of the missile in the event that they function how they do in the test drive. That way we can cover how the Bradley works now, while also future-proofing the video a bit. I will still include footage of the old missiles so you can get a bit of an idea of what they'll hopefully be performing like in the future. In footage using the old missiles, I'll add an asterisk symbol in the corner, and I'll also update the description in the event the missiles are changed. The Bradley fires tow ATGMs. They're very similar to the Shillelagh with a similar explosive mass and speed. Although at the moment they're a lot less snappy to control, they're a bit stiffer and in general wobble much less, but the overall corrections they make are still very large. They also leave a wire behind once fired. This disappears after some time, but it is visible on thermal images. Nothing you can do about it, but still good to keep in mind if you're trying to be stealthy. Also, as the missiles dip, try to aim slightly above of where you want to guide. They do have a tendency to slam into the floor if you aim too low. They will also lose guidance if you move the pointer too far away from the missile, so make sure that your movements are gentle. So, in general, on a good crew, these reload in around 15 seconds, which isn't too bad. They only reload together though, which can be situationally tedious. Something drastically more situationally tedious though is the launcher itself. Most ATGM vehicles can't fire on the move, or at least above a very low speed. But annoyingly with the Bradley, the launcher folds away once you hit 20 kph. Once folded against the turret, it takes three seconds to pop back up, which is very annoying when you need to shoot a missile at an enemy quickly. It seems like another feature that wasn't completely necessary even though it's realistic. It doesn't destroy the Bradley's ability outright or anything like that, but it does make it annoying to use in a way that feels unnecessary. But still, after using the Bradley for a while, you will start to play around this without even realising. There is another factor to the launcher too that I think could use some improvement. The main cannon, which your view is tied to, can only depress 9 degrees, but the launcher can depress 19 degrees. This is great, but you can't use it. You can't manually select the launcher as a weapon system, and since you're tied to the autocannon, you can't control the missile below the 9 degree mark, meaning there's a whole 10 degrees of depression that you can't properly access. You can aim it in third person, but this is much less accurate. It would be nice if there was a mode that would let you control the missile separately, like a toggle that would switch aiming points between the main crosshair and your pointer circle, for example. Either way, kind of a shame. Finally though, the Bradley is the first vehicle with a thermal gun sight. Once unlocked, you can toggle this on in Gunner View to help you spot tanks by their heat signature. These are only early Gen 1 thermals though, so the resolution is quite low, but it's still good for spotting tanks in foliage and scanning ridgelines. It can be quite tempting to just stick in thermal view once you unlock it, but I would really recommend only using it situationally. If you lock yourself in the gun sight, you sort of passively limit the scope of your vision, where you could be looking around in third person. Personally, I toggle thermal on and off quite rapidly while playing. I turn it on when scanning an area at range or looking through foliage, and then turn it off again when I know nothing's there. Definitely set up a hotkey for this one so you can toggle it quickly. It's a very useful tool, but overusing it will get you knocked out incidentally. So, the Bradley is very versatile for a light vehicle, but it's more of a support light vehicle than a traditional light vehicle, in that you can't really approach it like the more standard vehicles you're used to. Because the Bradley is so versatile, there's not much rigidity regarding where you should play it, at close range, you can use the autocannon effectively, and at the mid-ranges, at least for now, you can use the ATGM somewhat effectively within a thousand meters. So, the main thing you need to do is identify which map is best for each playstyle. 
The main thing to avoid with the Bradley is having to cross open areas outside of cover. The worst situation you can be in is meeting an enemy on equal footing. You'll be clicked on before your launcher deploys, and if what you're fighting is stabilised and not a light tank, you won't be able to destroy their barrel before you're clicked on. So you do need to be careful with your traversal through the map. Unless you're roaming through the flanks, you need to be careful when you choose to move. On most maps, you'll be moving from cover to cover, so make sure to listen for engines and slow down if you hear something coming. You can also try sticking with your team if you're not sure where best to position. If a teammate is drawing the enemy's attention, you can pop out and take out their barrel and tracks with your autocannon. The launcher is not unusable at close range, but like the Sheridan, it's currently not reliable. Since the missiles don't launch from your gun sight and are instead fired up and to the left, if you're engaging something right in front of you, you need to compensate for this by firing down and to the right of where you want the missile to land. It's a bit tedious and the missiles won't be accurate a lot of the time, but if you have to use them, try aiming like this. Currently, long range is not viable for the Bradley, but if and when the missiles are fixed, it will again become a very workable approach. For now, if you want to use the ATGMs, position around mid-range within around a kilometre. Within this margin, they are currently stable. If they're improved, the longer ranges will become a lot more viable. It's a pretty good spot for the Bradley in general. Because it's a small target, it can be very hard to hit at long range if you're hull down. You have 12 missiles, which is a huge amount compared to the Marders, BMP-2 and the Type 89, for example, that all only have four. So you do have a lot of longevity in these positions. A situational but quite fun tactic you can use if you're playing around 8.0 is activating your ESS. This is the engine smoke system. You can use this to hide yourself, which on its own is useful, but thermals can see through ESS. And as a lot of enemies in this BR don't have thermals, you can often just sit in the smoke and fire out of it accurately once you have thermals unlocked. Because of the issues with the missiles, the Bradley is currently lacking a fair amount of its usability, but it's still far from unusable. You're very mobile and have a fully stabilised autocannon. You can definitely still flank and rush and destroy a lot of tanks from the side. Your ideal approach though really depends on the map, there's no universal way to play it. If you're on a more campy map and can find a good position around mid-range, go for it. But if you have the routes and opportunities to flank, this is where it currently has the most usability. When you're stock, I'd either stay with your team and use them to farm assists by damaging enemies with your cannon, or stay at mid-range and play defensively. Both are workable introductions until you get the mobility upgrades. Aside from this though, in general, the Bradley is a very good vehicle for the mid to late stages of the match. You can take down aircraft with the autocannon, and because in the later stages of the game enemies are usually more scattered, there's often a lot more lighter vehicles and SPAA rolling around. You can do decently well here. So it's always going to be a good backup, and currently this is the situation where you'll likely be doing best with it. Sorry I can't really be more conclusive on the Bradley in terms of suggesting a playstyle right now. Let's just hope that the missiles see some improvements sooner rather than later, so it can get back some of its versatility. If this happens, it can really play anywhere. You have advantages at every range. Pros. Great mobility. Effective firepower. And versatile. And the cons. Poor survivability. And limited reaction time. Verdict. Well, Despite the current missile issues, I'd still get it. I think they'll be improved in the future, but even so, it is worth using now, if only just as a second spawn at 8.0. It does require the right map, but it is capable of being aggressive at close range. Right now, I'd spawn it later on in the match, or play at the closer ranges and support your team. It's pretty good at farming assists, and as you can scout, it can be a great way to get into CAS as well. Next, we have a direct upgrade, the M3A3 model of the Bradley, which overall is a universal improvement on the previous version, at the expense of a hefty BR increase. Armour is the simplest feature to cover, and it borders on a negative. 
The A3 has 25mm of RHA placed on top of its base aluminium alloy armour. This results in effectively no tangible change against any conventional tank round, although it does mean you can survive for a second or so against weaker autocannon fire. If you angle, most autocannon belts below APFSDS will struggle to get through you quickly. There are weak points all over that the enemy will eventually find, but it is strong enough to where if an enemy just holds down the fire button without properly aiming, you'll probably be able to disable them before they can break through your armour. This is still barely an upgrade, as at very close range, the stronger rounds can still break through. The armour though is still better in a slightly tangible way, so it's still worth a mention. The consequence of the armour though is hampered mobility. Mostly. The A3 has an extra 100 horsepower to compensate for the almost 8 tons of extra weight. It can turn on the spot faster, but is slower to accelerate and has a slightly worse top speed. This doesn't really hurt its playstyle much, as it can still do what it needs to, but it's just the shame that this is a consequence of an armour upgrade that's practically redundant, in-game anyway. Firepower though is a universal improvement. The A3 uses the same cannon, but gets an unlockable belt of full APFSDS. This round type will be very common throughout this video, and is generally the most powerful round you have access to. So, the 25mm on the Bradley is probably not the best introduction to it, so I won't go into it too much now. Basically, it's like Sabo, but can pen better all around. It's a nice upgrade for the Bradley here, as with this belt, you can easily get through the sides of some of the tougher MBTs like the T-Series. It's much nicer overall, but is still quite inaccurate, and is also a tier 4 modification, which does hurt a bit. This Bradley also has an optical tracker for aircraft. Using your lock key, you can get a lead indicator for planes and helis. The fire rate still makes it hard to engage faster aircraft, but this does help with aiming regardless. The ATGMs still currently aren't that usable here either, but I will approach this Bradley in the same way. What to do now, and what you can hopefully do in the future. Regarding missile types, the M3A3 has a nice selection. Stock, you have the TOW 2s, which, like the name suggests, are completely improved. The 2s are faster and have 800mm of penetration, which is enough to get through mostly everything you can fight. You still can't lol pen the cheeks of MBTs or defeat most ERA, but if you go for the weaker parts, these missiles will punch through no problem, and with a bit of force as well. They have a higher explosive mass of nearly 45 kilograms of equivalent explosive, and this tied with the extra penetration gives you a lot more residual energy and makes setting off ammo a lot easier. They're not point and click, but still rewarding if aimed well. Thankfully though, a new ATGM was added quite recently, the TOW 2A. These perform very similarly, with a slightly higher speed and a bit more explosive mass, but they're tandem ATGMs. These negate ERA, meaning you can cut through most of the Russian tanks. In general, you can get through anything you meet with ease, even when harshly up-tiered. These are also only a tier 1 mod, so they can be obtained very quickly. However, there's a third unlockable type which is a bit more interesting. These are the TOW 2Bs. They may seem underwhelming from just looking at the numbers at only 100mm of penetration, but they're not intended for punching through the front of armour. These missiles explode downwards through the roof. They also naturally fly above your pointer, so you can still aim like normal. These missiles offer a unique engagement opportunity that on some maps can be very useful. One disadvantage regular ATGMs have is against an enemy in partial cover. If you see a tank a mile away with a corner of their hull or turret poking out, as soon as they recognise an incoming missile, they're going to pull away. The two Bs negate that and will comfortably let you engage enemies in complete cover, which removes one of the general disadvantages of playing at long range. There's several tricks to using these too. You don't need to be completely perfect with your aim, as these missiles explode automatically when they're in proximity with an enemy. So, if an enemy is scouted behind a hill or you see their antenna, you can easily guesstimate where they are and hit them with the two Bs. Another tactic is using your drone as well. Since you can mark exactly where an enemy is, 
As long as they aren't moving, you can fly your ACGM over the marker and get a few cheeky kills that way. Although, a killer issue with the 2Bs is unpredictable damage. They should one-shot most light vehicles if the missile proxies properly, but it can take several penetrating hits against MBT sometimes. The 2As are much better at one-shotting. The 2Bs are quite weak against Russian MBTs especially. Most of these have quite thick roof armor and ERA, which really limits your damage. Also, they have a huge breach, which takes up most of the turret. So often this will soak up a lot of the jet. Also, these missiles annoyingly will proxy on your teammates. So if a friendly is between you and an enemy, you can't really hit them. They do let you engage enemies in a unique way, which is nice, but the damage can sometimes feel arbitrarily poor. And especially right now with the inaccuracy, it's really hard to get them working at long range. There's some more improvements on the technology side too. The thermals are upgraded at a higher resolution, and you also have a laser rangefinder. Much like the APFSDS rounds, this tool is much more useful on the regular tanks we'll see a bit later. But basically, at the press of a button, this automatically adjusts your range to the distance you're pointing at. It doesn't have any effect on your missiles, and as your 25mm cannon isn't that useful at long range, in general, this tool gets way more useful on the more conventional vehicles we'll see later. The A3 also has a commander sight. You can switch to this view with a hotkey, and with another hotkey you can fire your weaponry from the sight as well. I don't find these sights useful on most regular tanks, but it does have a small use here. As the commander sight is high up and in line with your launcher, you can use the sight when behind complete cover to aim over terrain in a way that you can't with a regular sight. There aren't many situations where you'll need to use this, but it can be a nice option for those specific spots. Unfortunately though, you still can't aim the missile the full 19 degrees down with this sight. It's still limited to the main gun. So, with all that out of the way, playstyle doesn't change too much. The M3A3 gets stronger across the board, but with such a big jump in BR from the previous Bradley, so do your enemies. The first Bradley was a bit more reliable at being aggressive, as there was a higher chance at meeting less capable enemies. Here though, at 9.7, everything is stabilized and everything is mobile, so it's hard to get to strong positions and flanks uncontested. This, combined with a slow firing cannon and the launcher delay, can make it a bit tedious to play on some maps. The more competent enemies almost force you into a more defensive playstyle. You can still flank and be aggressive, the dart belt will let you take out anything from the side, but you still need to be lucky with the route you pick. And realistically, you still need to be spaded for this to work. With the more powerful missiles, you do have more options at long range, but currently, again, not the most reliable at time of uploading. Like the previous Bradley, I'd suggest a similar playstyle. On the maps where you can push down varied flanking routes or stick with your team, you can play at close range. But if you need to be more defensive, find a spot around mid-range in cover. If the missiles do end up more like how they perform in the test drive though, long range will again become a good spot for this thing. So let's talk about which missile to main. You can take a mix of both A's and B's in pairs, so you get six sets of two. Largely it depends on the map, so there's no universal choice. The annoying aspect is that the two missiles work completely differently. If you have the two A's ready and you see an enemy right behind cover, it's going to be hard to hit them. And if you see a tank rolling over open ground and have the two B's loaded, you might miss out on an otherwise easy kill with the damage. At the end of the day, the missile you end up maining should reflect the spot you want to go for. If you're in a position that covers a lot of open ground, you could focus on the A's. Whereas, if you're covering lots of hills and ridges, the B's may be better. Just work out whichever scenario is more likely for the area you're covering, and choose your mix of missiles based on that. Also, if you don't have to, try to avoid controlling the missile as much as possible. It will still start veering off course, but I found that if you avoid moving it, this is where it remains the most stable. It can be tempting when you see it move to instantly try and correct it, but I found this only makes it worse a lot of the time. So keep it steady as much as you can. 
The issue with this defensive playstyle though is that the landscape changes a lot with this Bradley due to the BR. At 8.0, the first Bradley could sit behind cover and fire off toes without too much trouble. Thermals weren't as common, and neither were laser rangefinders. So overall, you could afford to just sit behind partial cover and lob missiles. At 9.7, this does get notably harder. Enemy tanks are much more capable and can deal with you quicker. You really need to position carefully and stay behind as much cover as you can. This is also why I still quite like the Tobees despite the damage. Because I find that they're a less predictable weapon. They let you position in areas that would otherwise be ineffective, so enemies will be less likely to look for you. A more universal issue though is that you'll be against drones in up tiers. You will be focused by these a lot. Drone pilots only get two missiles, so they will often go for the squishier tanks to guarantee a kill. You are very squishy, so if a drone spots a Bradley staying still behind a ridge, you're going to get one shot. There's not a reasonable way to counter this. You'll end up getting two to three kills and then get whacked by a Hellfire. The environment at this battle rating is just not a good fit for a weak defensive vehicle. There are just too many elements that counter this kind of playstyle here. The Dart Belt does help with engaging at close range, but as enemies are much faster and more reactive, it still fails to be a reliable way to play it a lot of the time. There's just not a perfect spot for this Bradley. It's very map dependent and doesn't have much longevity anywhere. The best you can really do is stay defensive from the start. Use the two Bs and eliminate some dug in tanks that are preventing your team from advancing. By the time your initial sightline dries up and cast starts spawning, Try and move further into the map and move from cover to cover. If you have a split of missiles, I'd always switch to the two A's at this stage. This kind of approach will usually get you some kills at the start. And by pushing further into the map, your position becomes a lot less predictable against drones and helis. Of course, make sure you're moving carefully though. If you can hear an engine or think an enemy is nearby, it is best to wait and keep the launcher deployed. This is a very dreamy step-by-step -step plan of what you should do. Of course, it's not always going to go down like this, but it's what I'd at least aim to do, as it preserves your advantages and makes you harder to hit from the air. Pros. Effective firepower. And versatile. And the cons. Poor survivability. And limited reaction time. Verdict. I would still get this one. Despite being weak in this bracket, it's still a great support vehicle because it's basically up tier proof. The two A's and B's can go through anything potentially, so the advantages it has are constantly usable. You'll be using this thing in a higher tier lineup most of the time anyway, and generally only in situations where the MBTs you have won't work as well. There's no pressure to main it. My approach to these videos is trying to find a playstyle that can keep you alive for as long as possible while still having an impact on the match. An issue with my format here though is that from a gameplay perspective, the M3A3 is basically just a shortcut for spawning in CAS. It might sound strange, but getting destroyed is kind of necessary to utilize the gameplay advantage it brings, scouting enemies and doing as much damage as possible for cheaper air spawns. So even though I focused on the negative aspects, they're only really negatives relative to the usual approach of these videos. So even though it's not a reliable vehicle on its own, it is still effective for what it needs to do. So it's good for your lineup, especially if you like your aircraft. So lastly in the line, we have the HSTVL, one of the most unique tanks in the entire tree and a huge deviation from the previous light vehicles. The name stands for High Survivability Test Vehicle. High survivability, not exactly relative to the enemies you'll be fighting, but it can take a shot here and there. Not really enough to live up to the name though. At this BR, you'll be fighting the best of the best. Armor in general is less prevalent, so going into your armor values isn't really important. It's just more numbers to remember that you'll never really need. The actual survivability though does have its merits in certain spots. Despite the sharp angle of the hull, it'll still barely stop anything above autocannons, same for the turret as well. 
But as the turret is free of ammo and only has one of the three crew members present, if you're hull down, it's absolutely possible to tank a few kinetic rounds without getting taken out. The gunner too is actually one of the crew in the hull, so if the commander gets taken out, your turret is free. Still, the crew in the hull will get hit with shrapnel before too long, but you can squeeze a bit of artificial survivability from this thing when hull down. Mobility is quite impressive in a disconnected way. It's very quick to accelerate and is nicely responsive, being able to comfortably cruise in the low 50s off-road and hit 25 in reverse too. You can reach the max speed of 83 kph on roads, but it's more likely you'll stick around 60 and 70 with light manoeuvres. Despite this level of mobility being objectively good, as this thing is 11-3, you're constantly going against the top MBTs. And while practically none of them can beat your speed in general situations, their off-road speed is good enough to where your mobility isn't a consistently overwhelming advantage. It's just not quite reliable against the competition when it comes to that first initial push. You are faster, but not to a point where it's comfortable. So, firepower. Now, I rarely see such a level of contention when it comes to one tank's offensive ability. This thing is regularly debated, and honestly for quite good reason. The firepower of the HSTVL is quite unique. It has a 75mm cannon with a 1.5 second autoloader, with the entire capacity of 26 rounds in the rack. It features modest performance for a dart of that caliber. Don't spend too much time looking at all the numbers here, all you really need to know is that you can't point and click on most MBTs from the front. You will always need to go for weak spots such as the breach, driver's port and lower plate etc. Light vehicles can really just be clicked on though. It also gets early thermals and as it's rank 7, the UAV it can launch has high quality thermals now too, making it really good for support when playing in a squad. Back to the round though. The main issue is that the damage is very inconsistent. Aside from the low caliber and low penetration, the primary reason for this is that it uses a different modifier for the dart. The dart from the big cannons MBTs use have a long modifier, whereas the dart used by the HSTVL has a short modifier. All this functionally means for gameplay is that the round creates less fragments when it penetrates and spools. It, by design, does less damage. And this sort of creates an all-encompassing problem for the HSTVL. From a gameplay perspective, this thing can feel unfair to you. A lot of the tactics for this stage of the game are mostly hardwired into your brain, and despite having similar baseline mechanics, the HSTVL can't really run on the usual autopilot you probably have when playing regular tanks. The footage that's been playing here is me effectively on this autopilot. Watching in hindsight, it's pretty easy to see the spot I should have been aiming for to hit the last crew member, but I think this illustrates just how prevalent this automatic play is. Sometimes when you're playing this thing on autopilot, it's really easy to just not think about it and aimlessly click into the side of an MBT, because, well, it works on everything else, right? The HSTVL is really quite unique in this regard. There's few tanks like it. Its firepower is too slow to approach it like an autocannon, spraying with the fire button down into an enemy tank, and also the damage is too weak to play it like a standard tank. You can comfortably autopilot in the extremes here as the approach is generally the same, you're used to it. But as the HSTVL is kind of in the middle, it requires more mindfulness to play a lot of the time from my experience. Even from the side, this tank will often fail to cause critical damage. It lacks the fragments to set off ammo sometimes, even if hitting it directly, and you really need to be pinpoint when it comes to the crew. And this factor of carefulness is sort of warranted. If you could just point and click on everything with a 1.5 second unbroken reload, this thing would be kind of busted, so it makes sense that you constantly have to go for these spots. But the issue is that even when you do, very little can happen. It's a very unrewarding and inconsistent experience. After pumping several shots into the side of an MBT and knocking it out, you don't even really feel satisfied, it always feels like it should be easier. We're sort of straying more into the feelings aspect here and not focusing on gameplay, but ultimately, a vehicle should feel fun to use. 
It should feel rewarding when you play it right, and satisfying when you get a kill. But even when you play this thing right, it can still fail in a way that doesn't feel fair. And I think that, albeit in an abstract way, is my problem with the vehicle. You've probably seen clips of people going nuts with this thing and getting an ace in 10 seconds, and yeah, those clips are exciting and you definitely will have some of those moments where the stars align and you end up behind the entire enemy team. Sometimes it really can work, but with clips like that, you only see the one instance where it works and not the 10 to 20 others where it doesn't. I'm spending a lot of time on the more conceptual parts of this vehicle, primarily for the reason of trying to level your expectations. As on the surface, this looks like it should be great, and you've probably seen examples of it being great, and if you set your heart on it based on those expectations, you likely will come away disappointed. But how can we make sure you get the most out of it? It's really a vehicle you need to go all in with. You'll often only get those great moments from being hyper-aggressive and pushing through the map, really using your mobility. If you get caught halfway, you'll only end up in positions that the top MBTs can reach, and on a level playing field against them, you can't really match up, so it's really all or nothing. Although you do have some great gun depression. Over the sides of the hull specifically, it can reach 17 degrees, which means you can use almost all of the map, Although, predictably, sniping isn't great, down to the poor performance of the round. But you can still do it and get some assists or kills on light vehicles. So, a more defensive spot is still possible. You'll likely stay alive for a while as well, due to the more survivable turret layout. But, of course, you won't be getting the most kills. And honestly, you'd be better off using an MBT for these spots. Another big factor is how you engage enemies. Because Hunter Killer is almost universal at this BR, going for crew outright isn't easy due to your low damage. Going for ammo too can be inconsistent for the same reason. You need your first shot to really count. As everything is much faster at this BR, if your shot fails, you will just be clicked on. The most reliable shot you have, unless you're confident that your enemy can't retaliate, is the breach or barrel. The damage to these parts is much more consistent and ensures that you can deal with the tank safely. The HSTVL is great at doing this because of how quickly you can follow up your shot. An enemy will not be able to run away before you can fire again, so you really should make use of it in those situations where you don't have the jump on someone. This is what I mean with the autopiloting we spoke about before. On most conventional tanks at this BR, you can go for those kill shots because usually the damage delivers, and it's tempting to do the same thing here. It's a hard habit to break because basically every other vehicle can do it apart from you. I've personally only found wide success with the HSTVL by turning that autopilot off and going for the safer shot first. If you're not completely at an enemy's side or behind them, this is the approach I'd take. Although, of course, you do want to be aiming to engage from these positions. And I think that's really the most important thing when choosing to play the HSTVL in that the only advantage you really have is the ability to fire a dart every one and a half seconds. If you're not playing in such a way that necessitates this advantage, any MBT would really be a better choice as they have a lot more reliability in these situations, which means you either need to get very good at snapping to the breach, or you need to be very selective about the maps you spawn on, and for consistency, the latter is what I'd aim for. Close range urban maps are much more consistent for this thing, as they give you multiple lanes into the map, which offer more opportunities to end up behind enemies. Rushing and being aggressive is what really works in this regard. You don't want to give your enemies time to react. Give them even a second or so to turn the hull, and suddenly your easy shot is a lot harder. Additionally, your engine is very loud, it's a gas turbine, so it's less about sneaking up on an enemy and more about getting the jump on them. Pros, great mobility, and rapid reload. And the cons, low versatility, and inconsistent firepower. Verdict, I would really consider it. For some of you, this would be a solid avoid, but there is some fun to be had here if you're confident with the playstyle it needs but its lack of map-based versatility and inconsistent damage doesn't really let it be a fun vehicle to use. Another difficulty is that its main playstyle really requires it to be spaded. 
the mobility upgrades help a lot in getting to those tricky spots. Unupgraded, you're not much faster than MBTs, not to the extent where it really matters anyway. So, in the sense of this vehicle being a tool in your belt, it's not one you'll regularly have to use, and its job can often be done more reliably by the other options you have. If you like this aggressive style of gameplay, you might enjoy it. If not though, best to stick to the main tanks at least to start with, and maybe down the line this thing will get some extra rounds or some more consistent damage. We'll just have to see. Back to some conventional tanks next, with the continuation of the M60 series, the M60A1 AOS. Similar to the regular M60, but with some welcome improvements. AOS stands for Add-on Stabilizer, which really gives this thing some breathing room. Armor has seen some nice improvements too. It's not immune by any means, but its ability to catch poorly placed shots is much better, which at 8.0 is the best armor can get most of the time. The hull is mostly the same, but the thickness of the upper plate has been increased by 15mm to 108 which won't stop any rounds the regular M60 couldn't while front on, but it does mean that baiting shots with the front plate and angling in general is more reliable. The turret, however, has seen a complete redesign. The neck and cupola are still APHE weak spots, but the cheeks are immune to almost everything under 105 heat. At some angles, even the heat can fail to penetrate. The mantlet is a bit weaker, but you will still catch the odd incoming kinetic round from time to time. There's nothing that you're immune to though, so being actively mindful of your armor isn't really necessary for playing it. If your hull downs the point where you can hide your turret neck though, it can be very strong if not up to too harshly. Mobility is a tiny bit worse than the regular M60, but not by much. The A1 is just under two tons heavier, but as the engine is the same, the difference is really minimal for gameplay. The slight hit to acceleration you have is barely noticeable, but it is a bit of a negative in the sense that mobility hasn't scaled up against the faster opponents you can now meet more regularly, although mobility is still good enough for what the M60 needs to do. Firepower is also largely unchanged. It gets the same unlockable set of early 105 shells, but does come with a different starting Sabo round, M728. This one was nerfed a bit recently, with the earlier round being buffed. The flat pen does on the surface seem terrible, but it carries a higher performance against harsh angles, which is the most important factor, as that's the armor you really need to beat. It can struggle a little bit now with spooling if you hit strong flat armor, but you will still rarely non-pen with it in my experience. Some of the footage is using the old Sabo model and some with the new. Personally, I haven't noticed any terrible detrimental change with it really. I'd still recommend the same approach to firepower as with the previous M60. The Sabo and Heat are both valid choices, but I prefer the Sabo as it effectively lets me fire faster due to the higher velocity. I do take some heat for the tougher vehicles and light tanks, but in general I would still stick to the Sabo. It won't get caught on tracks and soft cover and is still pretty workable. So, for playstyle, you really do have a lot of options, and that's always a bad thing for me recording this, as it makes it harder to describe exactly what, in my opinion, you should be aiming to do. Calling back to the Shermans, the M60A1 is really a tank tank. This is the dumb term I use to describe a vehicle that's kind of quintessential, in that its armor, firepower, and mobility don't hold it back to the point where you need to adjust your playstyle to accommodate for anything. I do find though that tanks that roughly fit this criteria are what I call filter vehicles, and if you haven't been playing for a long time, on the surface, a tank like this probably won't be too interesting to you right now. When you start playing, you'll probably enjoy tanks that have an advantage you can rely on. You can rely on the KV-1's armor, the Panther D's gun, and the M18's mobility for example, but they all have specific weaknesses alongside what they're good at. At the start, you'll likely be having the most success with vehicles that have a dominant advantage, and you'll probably actively seek out vehicles that have this. But after a certain point of familiarity with the game, it becomes less about seeking out a vehicle with a distinct advantage, and more about seeking out a vehicle that doesn't have a distinct disadvantage. See a disadvantage in this game as a hard cap on what you can do. It actively stops you from succeeding in certain situations. Poor gun depression, long reload, low speed, etc. 
These sorts of drawbacks can't be beaten. You can't skill your way into doubling your speed. You're actively required to change your approach to the game to accommodate for the vehicle's weaknesses. But a vehicle like the M60A1 doesn't require that, making its performance very dependent on your competence with core game mechanics. This is why I call it a filter vehicle. Before you break through that point of almost universal understanding of the game, you probably won't enjoy a tank like this as much. You'll need to position well, shoot fast and accurately, and use the reaction time window your armor gives you to knock out your enemy first. The M60A1 won't do anything for you, but it will let you do anything you need to. And if you want to succeed around this tier, this is the filter you need to break through. People often use the Jack of All Trades, Master of None to describe vehicles like this. But while that's accurate, I don't think it's necessarily helpful for forming a good idea about how effective tanks like this actually are. You might be a master of firepower, but your armor is kind of terrible. You might have amazing armor, but mobility could use some work. Your tank doesn't need to be the best at something to be effective overall. Don't let perfect become the enemy of good. I don't see this filter in the sense of stepping through and suddenly you're a new player. It's more about a change in mindset, relying less on what your vehicle does for you, and more about what your vehicle is actively letting you do. When this is the approach you have to the vehicle you're currently using, this is when you break through that filter, and will probably start enjoying modern vehicles a lot more. I don't think the M60A1 is necessarily the best vehicle to use as an example of this, but it's a good starting point for changing your state of play. A difficulty with this though is that most of what these videos are is dissecting a vehicle's drawbacks and then how to best counter them. I can't really do that with vehicles like this to the same extent. I will of course be following the same formula, no vehicle is perfect, but I can't really offer any grand shortcuts for hands-on experience, which is largely what you'll be needing. I'll be working in general tactics to these upcoming vehicles when we meet them though, so even though I can't really be as concise as the previous tiers, I'll still be covering everything I can. So, with that in mind, let's get back to the tank at hand. We don't have many disadvantages to mitigate, but we do have advantages to expand on. One disadvantage you need to be mindful of, though, is the lack of reactive mobility. The M60 is hardly fast, but it doesn't hold you back. It has quite slow acceleration and a poor reverse at only 8 kph, which makes backing out of a bad situation comparatively difficult. So, even though the armor you have definitely lets you play close and aggressive, Always be mindful of having cover nearby to back into if you get hit. You don't have smoke grenades, so if you're out in the open, you likely won't be recovering. For safety, and especially when stock, I'd recommend hanging back and hiding as much of your turret behind cover as possible. It's where your armor is strongest, and the lack of upgraded mobility won't hit you as hard. Once spaded though, you really can be a bit of a brawler. Angling your hull around corners is great for baiting shots. And if you take 38 rounds or less, the front floor ammo racks will be empty too. Also, make sure to pay attention to the battle rating you're playing at. In 8.0 matches, you'll still be fighting a lot of enemies that don't have a stabilizer, and this gives you a big advantage while playing aggressively. And it's really an advantage you can't afford to not utilize in these situations. A final aspect to note though is that this tank is comparatively huge. It's one of the tallest and bulkiest MBTs, which is something you'll need to be mindful of when moving through the map. It's not very stealthy and can't utilize certain cover. As the Coppola is an APHE trap, sometimes if you hide behind cover that most tanks can utilize, your roof will be exposed and it may get you taken out. There's of course nothing you can do to negate this, but do be aware of how tall you are and be careful around certain bits of cover. Keep it in the back of your mind while you play. Still though, there's no environment that you absolutely can't operate in. So, wherever your skills lie, you can prioritize sniping, brawling, or anything in between. Pros. Decent firepower. Decent survivability. And versatile. And the cons. Poor reactive mobility. Verdict. I would definitely get it this is one of the strongest starts you can have into rank 6. And even though it doesn't have much longevity, it's a great tank to start learning the flow of high tier games. It can't do everything, but it can let you do enough to have a fighting chance in any situation.
Next up, we have the M60A1 Rise P, which adds several additional features. The Rise gets an unlockable APFSDS round, M735, which is effectively the introductory primary dart for the US. Around your BR, you can point and click on anything really. In up tiers, you will struggle with the front plate of the Russian T-Series, but for most common tanks, you won't really have a problem. The most apparent change, though, is the ERA covering the tank. We saw this on the removed Magak Premium in the last episode, but briefly, ERA is Explosive Reactive Armor, and in this case offers 370mm of extra protection against incoming chemical projectiles, along with a tiny 5mm defense against Kinetic. Realistically, this stuff only protects against standard heat FS rounds. If a shell connects on the ERA directly, it will negate it, but the protection isn't complete. There is a big gap on the turret ring, which is often shot. And on top of that, it sadly doesn't have reliable protection against most ATGMs anyway. Dedicated ATGM carriers like the Rack Jagger 8.0, Mephisto 8.3, AFT-9 at 8.7, and the PVR-BV-551 at 8.0 all have missiles that can punch right through your ERA. This is a problem, as even though regular heat FS rounds can't get through, this is the stock round, and practically every player will be trying to replace it with a kinetic shell as fast as possible. What I'm saying is that the best rounds available to the tanks you'll commonly be fighting at this BR will cut right through your ERA, pretty much constantly. Admittedly though, heat projectiles that do get through often won't one-shot, as the ERA drastically reduces their energy so they cause less damage. But it's still not a reliable advantage. Which is a problem, as it's one of the reasons why it's 8-7, apart from the dart round. The dart round in and of itself is a relative advantage. It's capable at 8-7 in the same way the Sabre was capable at 8.0. In a gameplay sense, it's just scaling to fight tougher enemies with better protection. One advantage of the dart round here though is that it does let you click on enemies faster to a degree. You don't need to be quite as accurate, but it still hardly changes the game. It's not inherently giving the vehicle something new that lets it play differently, which is a further issue as that ERA is heavy, 5 tons heavy. And as the Rise doesn't have a new engine, you really feel the dent it makes. At this BR, MBTs start getting fast. The Leopards, Type 74s, and the Flurry of Light vehicles change the pace of matches up a lot. And at 8.7, you will be fighting the tougher end most of the time. You're one of the slowest vehicles at this tier. And that, on top of the M60's already poor reactive mobility, really makes this thing struggle all at the expense of an advantage that doesn't really work. Passive really is the word to describe this thing. It doesn't get any tangible active advantages, and two BR jumps for no active advantages really isn't fun. Your dart round is good, but practically every top round is good here. The only advantage this thing really has, and also the reason why I think it's 8-7, is that it's comparatively one of the hardest MBTs to knock out in one shot. Leos, T-55s, Type 74s, and all similar vehicles are very cramped and full of ammo. The M60 is pretty spacious, and when only taking a few rounds, it's hard to take it out in one hit, especially with chemical shells. Practically the only advantage tank players have that's present without them needing to do anything is survivability and comparatively, this tank is more survivable, and from my perspective, that's why it is where it is. Like the previous M60, it can still do everything, but just not as reliably due to the more advanced enemies and worse mobility. Because of this, I would recommend a more passive playstyle for staying alive. Hull down, most of your turret is protected by ERA. If you take 14 rounds, your turret is completely free of ammo. Although, I would recommend taking around 20 or so at least. In a defensive position, you're likely going to get some shots off before being hit yourself. So, by the time you do take a shot, you've probably emptied most of the rack anyway. You can stay alive for a while like this, so you can form a decent defensive position, but you likely won't get many kills, and due to thermals and the easier and more deadly cast options of this BR, 
A more sedentary playstyle still isn't quite as reliable as it would need to be to justify using this thing. Most of the time, I just end up playing it like the previous M60. It's not quite as good, but still works in the same way. So positioning just depends on the map and the playstyle you're more comfortable with. Because of the low speed, you'll struggle to reach strong early game spots, so an aggressive playstyle definitely requires the right map. Ultimately though, it just isn't very reliable in either position. Pros. Decent survivability, comparatively. And good firepower. And the cons. Poor mobility. Verdict. I would honestly avoid it. It doesn't have much of a lineup, and the amount of work you need to put in to spade it doesn't justify its potential. Stock, it doesn't actively offer anything over the previous M60 at 8.0. You can still play it like a tank tank and still have some good games, but you do have better options and they're not in this line. It's not unusable by any means, but the platform is really showing its age at this point. Capping off the M60s, we have the M60A3 TTS, which similarly to the Rise, adds some new features that arrive a little too late. TTS stands for Tank Thermal Sight. Only first gen thermals, but still, better than nothing. It also gets a laser rangefinder, which means you can instantly laser position and engage targets at range much more accurately. It's a lot more usable on this thing than the Bradley. It also gets a new dart round too, M774, which offers much better angled penetration. It only has stock heat instead of the stock heat and sabo the Rise had, which is very tedious. But the first of the two dart rounds is a tier 1 modification. And that's really it. It shaves off about half a ton of weight, but the aspects that made the Rise an unreliable vehicle are still here in the TTS. The improved round and thermals are good, but they don't help to mitigate the hard disadvantages it has. The only true new feature you have is the laser rangefinder, but it's a tier 4 modification, and as the TTS is the last tank in the line, the RP cost to get there is a slog. The last tier of modifications combined is over 130,000 RP right now. The top round it gets for 9.0 is undeniably good, but it's still a relative upgrade. You can deal with stronger tanks more easily, but these tanks can more easily deal with you and have actual tangible gameplay advantages over you. You have the technology now, but the platform is just poor. Something to note about the rangefinder though is that once you get it, it's tempting to overuse it. It aims for you, so you're going to want to make the most of that, but at closer ranges, you don't really need it. It takes around a second to acquire the range, and if you're close, in that time an enemy could just click on you. Only use the laser if you're at long range, or if you know you have that extra second to laser the target. If an enemy is close and aware of you, just go for the shot. The rounds are still easy enough to aim. The only way that I can see to really improve these vehicles apart from their BR is reload. Like the CM11 in the Chinese tree, I'd like to see these M60s get a reload buff. Compared to most MBTs, the turret is comparatively very spacious, and there's ammo readily available. Liberties can always be taken with reload times, and I'd like to see it done here, as there's not really any other hard factors that can make these tanks better. With a fast reload, they'd be able to perform better in every situation, which would be great. For now though, playstyle doesn't change much. Because of the laser and thermals, you can snipe more accurately and quickly at range, and this kind of position is the most reliable for it. With the upgraded dart, you can point and click on a lot of enemies around your BR very quickly. But in up tiers, you'll be meeting T-72Bs, Challenger 1s, etc, which are really in a different league. I don't like using the tanks you can meet in a full up tier as an argument a lot of the time, as of course you won't be seeing full teams of them, and it's often not a testament to the ability of the vehicle in question, but even in a full down tier, all of your weaknesses are still there. So there's never a situation where this thing can truly be dominant. The new tech is nice, but the lack of mobility at a BR that practically revolves around it is really disappointing. Still, you can just roam around with this thing. 
Late game especially, you can just roll around the map and click on things. I don't want to present the idea that this kind of approach is impossible. You can still be a tank here, but you will often miss out on the best routes and positions down to the mobility. Pros. Good firepower. And the cons. Poor mobility. And poor survivability. Verdict. I would again avoid it. The armor is the same, but I have added survivability as a negative here as a 9.0. It's the mobility that really starts passively letting it down in terms of keeping it alive. At 9.0, it barely offers anything reliable outside of being a sniper. It's not exactly bad in this role, but it can't do much else consistently, whereas almost every other MBT here can. And even then, to make it work well in this role, you do need to spade it, which is going to take a long time. Too long to make it worth it. So, until the BRs get shifted or some other factor changes, I would avoid the tail end of this line. Next, we have the T95E1. Not at all similar to the regular T95 from the last episode. This is one of, if not the last tank America currently has that fits into the old meta, where raw armor and firepower take focus over technology and speed. The firepower of the T95E1 is quite interesting. It has a 90mm cannon that carries smoke and HE. Actually, the HE round has one of the longest shell names in the game, but the main round is actually an APFSDS round, one of the earliest examples found on a conventional tank in the game. It is an earlier dart, you can see this by the steel in brackets here, but it doesn't have any hard differences to the later darts. It's just not as powerful for the same reasons every shell type varies in performance. So there's no artificial drawbacks like the HSTVL currently has. With a max pen of just under 300 millimeters, you'll rarely be struggling with anything. You can negate almost all armor, set off ammo, and take out crew quite consistently. It's a bit less reliable at hitting ammo at the back of turrets and spalling through fuel tanks due to the low-ish pen comparatively, but you won't be struggling too much with the gun. Personally, I try to go for ammo or center mass if the vehicle I'm fighting is quite cramped. The round is good enough to facilitate this. The turret traverse is also very quick. It's as fast as the M47 and just under 10 seconds faster than the M60s. 25.2 seconds on a stock crew when spaded. You can get this thing up to 36 seconds on an ace crew, which really helps being aggressive. There are a few negatives though. It doesn't have a stabilizer and has a longer than average reload at 11.1 seconds stock. Most tanks of this BR have around an 8.7 stock reload, so against most MBTs, you will lose out. On an ace crew, you can only get it down to 8.5 seconds, so you'll almost never completely outpace anything outside of the T10. Almost all tanks on the T54-55 platform have this reload too for a wider comparison. So for firepower, pros and cons across the board. Mobility is a bit less impressive, especially while stock. It does have a top speed of 56 kph, but this can only be met on roads. Off-road, you'll mostly be staying within the early to mid 30s. It does have nice neutral steering and a 12 kph reverse, but the 650 horsepower engine does mean it struggles with uneven terrain and accelerating. It doesn't in any way kill the vehicle, but it does make the stock experience quite tedious. So it's very important to stick to the roads when leaving spawn with this one. Armor is quite interesting. It's overall pretty strong. The frontal and even side armor is relatively effective, so you can actually angle with it somewhat. Against HeatFS and Sabo, most parts of the armor can be penetrated without too much trouble, but it's a lot stronger against APHE and AP, which are still common here. There are weak points like the roof optic, turret neck, and the corners of the front plate, but overall the armor is pretty varied and workable. It is difficult to cover as a whole though, as technically from every angle, most of the common rounds you'll fight can get through you somewhere. This is almost always the case with every tank in the game, but it's less defined with this one. There's lots of small armor segments and weak points you can't negate by angling. Because the armor is in set segments, as the tank hasn't been updated to volumetric yet, the protection can vary quite dramatically. 
This is kind of a positive and a negative, in that it's hard to explain which parts of armour are the strongest, but it also makes it more difficult for an enemy to work out exactly where they should be shooting. The weak spots are defined, but the rest of the armour which they can get through isn't, which does give this thing a nice window of reaction time, which is really the best thing a tank that needs to rely on its armour can have. Playing this thing aggressively and keeping on the move is the key to doing well with it. It is hard for enemies to quickly pinpoint the part of the armour they should hit. Heat and Sabo can just punch through sure, but at 8.0 they can mostly do this anywhere. The advantage the T95 has against them is that some parts of the armour can still bounce, and if you only take 22 rounds of ammo, the hull is completely free. So enemies using these rounds will often just point and click on you without too much thought, hitting all the empty space inside the hull. I won't pretend this will happen to you constantly, but it can and it does, and that's the best you can hope for against rounds like this. Keeping your armour profile vague and constantly changing during engagements makes the armour as workable as it can be, despite all the weak spots you can identify. And this is why I don't like sitting in the hangar and pointing and clicking at the armour of tanks. One, because you can do this in your own time specific to what you want to find out, but primarily it's because it's not a good representation for forming an argument about a tank's survivability. All this is really simulating is giving any potential enemy a free, perfect shot at you. If the tank hits you there, you're going to get knocked out. See? Armour bad. But in reality, if you're in a situation in the game where you're giving the enemy this kind of shot, you've already lost. All it does is show that a shot into any given weak spot is possible, but that doesn't automatically make it likely. Everyone in this game is fallible. They won't be hitting perfect shots all of the time. And armour that works for catching imperfect shots is really the best kind of armour you can have in this game, at least in regards to balancing. Tanks that have no frontal weak points like the T-32E1 and Maus will always be in a hard spot because of this. Anyway, I hope you can see what I mean here. For what it is, protection is workable most of the time. So playstyle is primarily just a runoff of this point. Keep on the move and keep your armour undefined. This is really at the core, but we still have some weaknesses to mitigate. When on the move, the gun can be decently stable, but will start to bounce a lot when coming to a stop. So if you do meet an enemy while in motion, I'd suggest letting the tank roll while you fire instead of pulling it to a stop. It really helps with snapshots. If you're stationary and know you're going to take a hit, try wiggling the hull and turret from side to side. This can really throw off an enemy's aim. Also, if you are taking 22 shells, you can quite reliably bait out the front plate's enemies from behind corners. A lot of the time they will bounce, but even if they don't, you'll only lose the driver, so it's comparatively fairly safe. Mobility can hurt you on some maps though, especially while you're stock. Despite lacking a rangefinder, the dart is high velocity enough to where you can snipe effectively. So before you get the mobility upgrades, Fighting at range can be an option. You may need adjustment of fire though, the accuracy at long range isn't too great. I'd also recommend this on hilly maps as well, as your mobility here will rarely be enough to push into a powerful spot early on. Also, as we've mentioned, the 8.0 lineup is pretty extensive. If you're fully up-tiered, I would go for the M60A1 or the Bradley over this thing as the lack of stabilizer and inherently having advantages that tie into the old meta may leave you a bit outclassed. Pros, good survivability, decent firepower, and versatile. And the cons, poor mobility, no stabilizer, and comparatively long reload. Verdict, I would definitely get it. In the right situation, it feels really fun. I had a talisman on this back in the day, and it was really great for unlocking everything. It can be tricky while stock and when up-tiered, but your best round is available from the start, and it's free, which is always nice. It isn't quite as versatile as the M60A1, but still has a strong place. Next up, we have the XM803 which is quite an abrupt change of pace, quite literally. It's a very quick shift in design and a mostly welcome one for America's MBTs. Armour at this tier is still barely a factor. 
but compared to other MBTs that spec more into mobility, it's not particularly bad in a relative sense. It's good for what it is, but doesn't cross the threshold into reliability. The primary advantage is that it's functionally immune from most autocannons from the front. The Puma, BMP2, Beglite, etc. can't get through you frontally. The APF-SDS belt on the 2S38 can, but only really the hull, unless you're point blank. So, for a 9.0 tank, this advantage is actually quite good in some situations. The issue though is survivability. Aside from autocannons, every other conventional gun around this BR can get through you, chemical or kinetic. The mantlet can catch shots and the rounded sides of the turret cheeks can bounce too, but this thing only has three crew and two of them are effectively in a line. Any shot into the left side of the turret when facing it will often take it out in one shot, unless your crew vitality is quite high. However, the tank is fairly unique in that there are no crew in the hull, with the driver being on the right side of the turret. Additionally, if you take 26 rounds or less, there's no ammo in the hull either. This doesn't mean too much, as this tank is still quite common and a lot of enemies will know just to shoot out the crew in the turret, but taking only 26 rounds can help you if you meet an enemy that just clicks on you aimlessly. It's not a guarantee of survival, as the legs of the crew still fall in the hull, but there's no reason to take more than 26 rounds in any case. It can only help. Firepower initially will be quite familiar. Stock, this thing has identical rounds to the Sheridan, Heat and the Shillelagh ATGM. No high explosive though. But it also gets an APF-SDS round, rivaling the HE round on the T95E1 in regards to an imaginative name. Recently, this thing lost a lot of pen. It's actually very similar to the dart on the T95 now. But this nerf honestly doesn't really change much. You still click on most tanks you'll run into, and the tanks that are tricky were still tricky pre-nerf. The lower pen does mean you lose some ammo racking potential if the ammo is at the back of the tank you're fighting, but generally the round will still work, although in terms of reliable damage it's definitely on the weaker end. There's not really too many specifics we can go into with the shell, as around this BR darts are mostly universal and apart from having different pen values, their strengths are practically the same. The 803 also has a very responsive firing platform. Recently, its traverse rates got buffed a fair bit. On an expert crew, when spaded, you can get the turret traverse to 39.5 degrees a second. It's now actually the MBT with the fastest turret traverse in the BR range. Only by a few degrees, but still, it's very responsive. Gun elevation speed is the same as well. So, when driving over rough terrain, you can keep the gun on target effortlessly. The XM is also auto-loaded. It has a fixed 7.5 second reload, with 10 seconds again for the ATGM. And this reload is... eh? It's faster than the stock reload of most non-autoloaded tanks, but on a good crew, most of these vehicles will match or beat your reload if experted, outside of Russian and some Chinese stuff. But it's also the slowest of the autoloaders too, so if you're meeting T-72s or anything similar, you'll always lose the reload cycle. It's not the worst thing in the world, but if we assume most enemies will be using an expert crew, your reload will be average at the very best and often worse off. 7.5 seconds may not seem too bad, but it will often let you down. Mobility, however, is nice. With a 1,250 horsepower engine, it's a welcome change from the M60s. Off-road, you can comfortably stay in the 40s, and the max speed is nicely reachable on roads too. It also has neutral steering and can move as fast in reverse as it can forwards, meaning that finally MBTs start getting fast. But is all of this enough? The XM803 can do a lot more than the late M60s, but at 9.0 it's just quite an average vehicle. It's not bad, it's still very versatile, but 9.0 is commonly up at 9.7 and 10.0 and the landscape at this point gets a lot more competitive vehicle-wise. Around this BR, because practically all MBTs can boast good mobility and firepower, the playing field is leveled. There's less vehicles you can almost always bully. Everything in general is now more of a threat to you. And even though it doesn't have any distinct disadvantages, 
Its survivability and firepower let it down in a way that the mobility can't always compensate for. Survivability ends up being one of the bigger detriments here. You're very easy to one-shot through the turrets, which is always going to be visible in an engagement. The reload again is another aspect that isn't exactly a hard detriment, but it rarely ever helps you either. It's almost completely average. The one thing you can rely on though is your mobility. Straight line speed and reactivity are both great. So making this thing work is mostly just picking the right spot for it and reacting well from there. As you have the laser rangefinder, it is possible to snipe. The responsive reverse gear helps a lot with this as well, but the dart is one of the weakest at this BR. You can still knock out anything, but it isn't forgiving. And for long range, a forgiving shell is ideal to compensate for the variance in accuracy. Speaking of, for the longest time, this shell was very inaccurate. But when playing it again recently, I can't say I've really felt it. Also, you don't have thermals, which isn't an active detriment, but it's always nice to have for sniping as you can often spot targets a bit quicker. If you do snipe, make sure to avoid just sitting there with your turret out. Because of the responsive mobility, you can poke in and out of cover quickly. Because of how huge and generally weak the turret is, you really want to avoid taking a shot, as the one-shot chance is quite high. Something else that can help you here is a feature that I don't believe is actually telegraphed anywhere. You actually have some degree of hydropneumatic suspension control. With the clearance hotkeys, you can make yourself effectively taller or shorter. This doesn't help much, but in some instances you can make use of cover more effectively. I personally rarely use it, as on this tank in particular, you can't tilt the suspension, only being able to move it up and down. Also, back to the turret. Regardless of where you are, do be mindful of just how large your turret is. It's the size of a small tank itself. So, if your hull is behind cover and you have to turn the turret, the back, full of ammo, will probably be exposed. It's not, ironically, a massive problem, but it's good to keep in mind, as it might cause you a few avoidable deaths. When spaded, this thing can work quite well aggressively. Your mobility is the most reliable asset you have, and can take you to some good positions. Because of the quick acceleration, you can move around cover quickly, and can easily pop out to fire at something, or back out of a situation with the reverse gear. Most of the time, I'd aim to use the mobility to reach a power position in the map, somewhere where you can stay in complete cover, and pop out when an enemy comes into view. On some urban maps, you can afford to aim for the flanks. You're fast enough to do it, but it's only really viable on maps with multiple lanes. But with a bit of luck, you can get some great results if you can pull up on the side or rear of enemies. Just be mindful of your reload as it can catch you out, especially if you're engaged with more than one enemy. Annoyingly, there's not too much else I can go into with this one. As I'm writing this, and now speaking it, I feel like I've not really done an adequate job of explaining how best to use it. But there's not really much of an answer. Part of that is just the jack-of-all-trades nature of modern MBTs, but generally it's the reload and survivability that stop it from being reliable, as these elements can't be mitigated. They are hard problems that exist regardless of where you position, which ultimately just ends on the perspective of the 803 just being a quintessentially average vehicle. Pros, great mobility, and versatile. And the cons, poor survivability, and comparatively long reload. Verdict, I would consider it. That may be a bit surprising, as the vehicle is of course quite appealing. It's the first tank here that gives you truly workable mobility, so you probably would like using it on that basis as it does feel like something new. And as that shift in ability is so abrupt, you'll probably find yourself enjoying the vehicle regardless. But it is underwhelming at 9.0 relatively. It's still workable and definitely a vehicle you can have success with, especially over the M60s, but its drawbacks make it difficult to have this reliably. And for me, we'll talk about this more at the end, the considerate here is more about the lineup it operates in. If you're very confident with maps, I've got no doubt you can pull some good games with this thing, but if it doesn't seem like your kind of tank on the surface, it probably won't be in practice either. Next up, we have the MBT-70. 
which actually came before the XM803. Despite being functionally very similar, the MBT-70 does have a number of improvements, which were cut from the XM803 largely in order to save costs. Armor is slightly different due to the design of the turret, but not really different enough to where it affects gameplay. Slight change, but not really worth focusing on. Mobility is improved too. It has an extra 225 horsepower for a total of 1,475, which rivals that of even top-tier MBTs. The suspension control is also more useful here too. In addition to the height adjustment, you can also tilt. This often won't come into play, but it does effectively mean you can give yourself extra gun depression by tilting the front forwards. There's only a few spots where this is necessary, so the advantage is small, but it's there if you need it, which is still nice. Firepower for the primary gun is identical, no change at all. But the nicest addition we have is a 20mm cannon on the roof. At 100 meters, you have around 50mm of pen with this thing, meaning you can use it to punch through the sides of some MBTs, shred light tanks, and easily disable barrels and tracks. It's also pretty good at taking out helis and slower aircraft as well. However, it doesn't get the buff to traverse rate that the 803 had, so it is a little bit slower there. Although it really doesn't hurt the tank, reactivity is still a strong point. It's unlikely in regular gameplay that you'll be in a situation where the slower speed gets you taken out. At 9.3, this thing is better, but it doesn't really do anything to help mitigate the weaknesses. The drawbacks are all still here. It can fight tougher enemies more regularly now too, so you could even argue the survivability is effectively worse. However, you really do feel that extra kick from the additional horsepower. This thing accelerates and turns effortlessly when spaded. You won't reach a higher top speed, but you absolutely will be moving through the map faster. And ultimately, even though its advantages are gimmicky and still somewhat limited, it does definitely feel more fun to use. The 20mm really adds a lot, and getting kills with it does feel satisfying. It can save you in some situations too. If you're at close range and you lose your breach, you can switch to the 20 to disable the tank attacking you. But the issue is that the MBT-70 doesn't really let you expand much on the playstyle. Its reliability falters in the same ways. But with the extra mobility, I do find it more consistent when going for an aggressive playstyle. And this is my usual plan when playing the MBT. From that point, I generally just react to what's happening around me. You can easily push up or back off depending on the situation. And if you get caught out, the 20 can occasionally save you. If you're playing the MBT, you really should be actively using the mobility. If you aren't, you could just play the 803 at a lower BR for arguably the same result. This obviously isn't a black and white thing, the MBT is objectively better in several ways which will help you, but it's more of a mindset you should have. I would still be a bit more defensive until you can go for the mobility upgrades, but once you're decently quick, this is the playstyle I would go for especially as you can only really use the 20 at close range. Its accuracy isn't amazing, and at distance, you will struggle to do enough damage to an enemy's barrel before they fire again. So, close range will squeeze the most out of the advantages you have. It might also be helpful to set up a hotkey for direct control of the 20 as well. There is some parallax, so aiming in the main view can be a bit tricky when you need to disable a barrel as quickly as possible. So, aim to ambush, or rush to a power position, and then react from there. That's quite nebulous direction, I guess, as anything can happen before and after this point, but again, due to the universal nature of MBTs, the outcome of what comes next is largely down to your individual knowledge and reaction time. Regardless though, this kind of positioning gets you in a location to employ your advantages as a vehicle. If you're confident with being aggressive, hitting the flanks hard can lead to some decent results. You'll outpace most MBTs, so you'll have a good chance to catch them off guard once you're set up. This is especially good, as your round, while still workable, is weak against the higher end of MBTs you will run into. So, getting that first shot to land accurately is very important. Additionally, if you run headfirst into a light tank, you have the 20 to help if you don't one-shot them with the main gun. It's quite good for making people panic too, so on applicable maps and BRs, this is what I'd aim for. Pros great mobility, effective secondary, and versatile. And the cons, poor survivability, and comparatively long reload. Verdict, 
I'd again consider it. Despite the buffs, it still fails to be reliable and will struggle against the tanks you'll meet in up tiers especially. I find the tank more fun, but to get to that point you still need to mostly spade it, and also research it after the XM, which is optional. I have both of these under the considerate blanket because, despite being able to make a lineup with them, this bracket is very commonly uptiered, and the shift in ability from 9-3 to 10-3 is big, so the lack of reliability really hurts, and can lead to an experience that just isn't very enjoyable overall. We'll talk more about lineups at the end, so maybe wait for that part of the video until you make your own verdict, but up next is the start of what you're probably here to see. So, next up we have the M1 Abrams, which doesn't need any introduction. This MBT will be the basis for basically all of America's endline vehicles, so it better be good. This version of the Abrams is equipped with a 105 that can fire the two introductory dart rounds, M735 and M774, the same rounds available on the M60 TTS. At 10-3, these rounds still work, but they aren't overly reliable. You can still pen mostly anything you meet, but the round doesn't have the most spooling if you hit stronger parts of armor. So the damage doesn't always feel hugely consistent. But what makes up for it though is the reload. 6.5 seconds stock, 5 seconds aced. This is great, and the fastest consistent MBT reload at this BR, apart from the Type 90. As long as you have a good crew. It also has early thermals, and the gun handling is nicely responsive. Its gun depression is pretty standard at 10 degrees, so it can pretty much play anywhere. Mobility 2 is great. With just over 1500 horsepower, it feels really nice to drive. Hull Traverse is quick and it accelerates well, giving it nice defensive mobility. When spaded, you can expect to cruise in the high 40s off-road, even with slight adjustments. Reverse gear is very impressive too. For armor though, it's difficult to contextualize how effective it is in a useful way. This mostly goes for all endline MBT designs, but more so for the Abrams. So, it might sound stupid, but I don't actually want to go into this thing's hard armor protection, because I don't think that knowing it is that valuable. Anything can pen you, not to say that it will, but anything can. There's no environment where you're completely immune to anything. In very general terms regarding endline MBT designs, outside of the Arietti because, well, you know. You could say the Abrams is the easiest to penetrate, but the hardest to one-shot, which obviously isn't always going to be the case, you can get taken out in one shot, but generally it is survivable. The issue the Abrams collectively have is that their weak spot is much more defined. The turret ring is exposed entirely, there's a big gap to hit, and it extends over the whole front of the tank. And I think this is more so the problem. Common top tier tanks like the T-80 series have a defined weak spot around the driver's port. Most guns can still punch through this, but it's a small square which is harder to hit quickly. With the Abrams, their weak point spans laterally across the entire vehicle. If the enemy has their pointer over the tank anywhere, even at the edges, it only takes a small movement to aim at a point where any gun can reasonably get through the ring, and often the sloped upper plate as well. So, effectively, an enemy requires less time to aim and penetrate when compared to other vehicles. Again, this is not an absolute, it's a generalization. A lot of top tier is in your reaction times. Because anything can pen anything, at least on weak spots, it's all about how quickly you can identify what you're fighting and click on the spot that will lead to that critical penetration. And so, tanks with less defined weak spots will always have a little bit longer in this interaction. The design of the Abrams doesn't change. All of the variants look the same and are easy to identify. The Abrams is a very common vehicle to find here. And as every enemy is so familiar with this vehicle's design, they are completely conditioned to deal with it. It doesn't actively matter how much armor you have on your turret cheeks or lower plate, when the process of dealing with an Abrams is so streamlined. I'm talking a lot about this aspect because I think it's very easy to get caught up in the perspective of, if I had more armor, I'd die less. If my round could pen more, I'd die less. But it's really not what's important. 
It's almost like survivorship bias for aircraft. You can put as much armor as you like on the wings to the point where they're immune to cannon fire, but if you still have no protection around the engines, you'll go down just the same. If anything, it almost makes the addition of armor on these parts less effective. You slow yourself down, and enemies that know where your armored parts are will just learn to shoot the weak section every time anyway, and get good at doing it consistently over time. Sorry for hammering this point as much as I am, but you likely won't enjoy these vehicles if you put all of your stock in their armor. As long as you have weak spots, it doesn't actively matter. I say actively because passively the armor will still work in catching poorly aimed shells, as long as you aren't giving the enemy a static easy shot on you. Your cheeks and parts of the hull will cause bounces. To get the most out of your armor on this vehicle, you need to play as if you don't have any. Everyone can pen you, so expect that they will if you let them. The best location you have for keeping yourself alive is hull down. The most powerful guns at this BR can get through your cheeks, but many can't. So hiding as much of your turret ring as possible is the best shot you have. Most guns can still get through your breach, but that's universal. And it's more of a square than a line, so it's harder to hit. Comparatively though, the Abrams does have quite a strong breach. Even stronger shells can fail if they hit certain parts. It's not overly reliable, but it's still worth mentioning that in this position, the armor is as solid as it gets. Another benefit to this is that because all Abrams loosely look the same, even tanks that could get through your cheeks often won't aim for them. The later versions of the Abrams do have turret armor that negates darts. So in the split second an enemy has to identify you, their mind will usually just go to Abrams, hull down, breach. Again, generalization, but this has been my experience. They'll usually shoot the breach when they could go for the cheeks, which is going to cause less damage. However, the M1 Abrams in particular is not the best for this engagement. You have one of the weakest guns at the BR and will often need to aim for weak spots on most enemies. These kinds of hull down positions usually lead to a more long range playstyle, which you can succeed at, but it's not as reliable. Close range really lets you get the most out of your advantages, but it is where you're the most vulnerable. An issue with your weak spot as well is that it's impossible to make it less defined. If a T-80 angles slightly, the driver's port becomes more inconsistent to penetrate. With the Abrams, you can angle, keep on the move, change direction, but this constant lateral weak spot will always normalize to whatever you're fighting. So you're always vulnerable in this situation but it is more high risk, high reward. Here you can aim for weak spots more easily, your reload will help you engage enemies quickly, and your mobility will come into play both offensively and defensively. This is where you have the most potential, but a mistake will usually see you taken out. You can hit 38 in reverse, so if you take a shot into the turret and lose your breach, you can quickly back up. But to survive after this point, you want some kind of buffer between you and your enemy either hard cover or teammates. MBTs are very quick here, and if one gives chase and you're on your own, you will get caught. There's pros and cons to both engagement ranges. If you feel you have good reaction times, you'll probably enjoy the closer ranges a lot. If you are going for a more defensive approach though, try to keep moving around after you destroy something. Cass is very abundant and easier to use at this BR. If you stay in the same spot, you will get hit from the air. Also, try to take around 25 or so rounds into battle. Your ready rack is at the back of the turret, and if you take too many, it will be completely full. If you take around this amount, it keeps it roughly half empty. Regarding this rack as well, the Abrams has blowout panels. This means that if an enemy shoots into the back of the turret from the side hitting ammo, there's a chance you'll lose your ammo rack, but you won't get taken out. You're usually a bit useless after this point, unless you can find a cap to replenish on, but still. Also, if this does happen, turn your turret so the back is clear of the engine deck. Otherwise, the fire from the ammo storage will burn your engine, and you'll need to use a charge of FPE to put it out. Another factor here as well is that the Abrams has a very large ready rack in the turret. Tanks like the Macavers, Challengers, and even the Leo 2s have quite a small rack, lololololol, which can limit how aggressive they can be. It's the worst thing to be having a great game just to realize your rack is out and your reload gets you destroyed. It's not really an active thing, but it's still worth mentioning as another tick for the Abrams. Anyway, what I personally try to do is rush early game and set up on a light flank. 
From the side, you can get through anything. So, putting yourself in this position early can help you take out a few of the slower early spawns with your rapid reload. Either way though, the only disadvantage you really have is your firepower being inconsistent. So, try to avoid situations where you're fighting the enemy head on. They likely will have better guns and more armor. So, always try to use that mobility to put yourself on the sides of the most commonly traveled routes into the map. Not every map can accommodate for this, however. Ultimately, and annoyingly, this is really the part where I can't give much concrete advice for what I think you should do. It's easy to be objective for tanks that have hard drawbacks, but for tanks that don't really have them, you can only really be subjective in how they should be approached. And I think this is why a lot of people like top tier. Certain tanks are of course more reliable than others, but they can all basically do anything. You can really mould them to whichever playstyle you personally like best. I don't want to present my approach to these tanks as the objective best way to do it, because the way I play caters to the skill set I have that I feel is the strongest. Yours may be different, and so going with my approach may not work. For this tier, you need map knowledge, you need to know where to shoot, and you need reaction times. Lower tiers have this too, but for top tier, as every tank is so capable, these core points are the most important. And I can't really cover these without spending way too long on all the different situations and variations. A lot of it just comes with time and building up your own skills, which is why I will always recommend you don't just buy your way into top tier. It probably won't end up being too fun. All in all though, the M1 Abrams is the fastest model, and one of the fastest tanks at this BR range. Despite hull down being good for survivability, it does mean that you're missing out on one of your greatest assets. If you're a player that feels confident being aggressive and rushing in early for those side shots, this can work really well. But if we're honest, a lot of this requires luck. If you rush along an early flank uncontested, you can really dent the enemy team early on and will pick up a lot of kills this way. But if a few enemies have the same idea, it probably won't go as well. I mention this because I feel it's easy to present a vehicle disingenuously in a YouTube video like this. Not deliberately, but if I just show solid gameplay of early rushes with the Abrams with good success, it may paint the picture that this happens every time, which it doesn't. You can have amazing results with this approach. It does give you the most potential, but it really depends on where enemies are a lot of the time. A lot of my highest kill games in the Abrams have been with this playstyle. But in those games, I often don't even take a shot. Not because I'm the bestest player EU West, but because the route I picked was perfect to counter the route the enemy picked. What I'm trying to say is that it's often easy to make this approach look effortless, and you may feel like you're doing something wrong when you try to replicate it and it's not working out, which is not the case at all really. These kind of playstyles are the most entertaining to watch, but for playing the game regularly, you need to be a bit more careful when you choose to take this approach. I get to choose what I'm putting on the screen after all. Sometimes it really is better to play a bit more carefully. Regardless though, the advantages of the M1 Abrams align to this aggressive playstyle very well. So when it works, it really works. Finally, as I'd like to at least mention it, it would take a bit too long to go into the best spots to shoot on contemporary MBTs. So I would absolutely recommend going into the protection analysis and at least looking over the Leopard 2s, T-80s, and T-72s to get a better idea of where you should shoot. It's always good to look over these things at your own pace. So, when you do get to this BR, definitely take some time to look over the most common tanks you'll be fighting. Pros. Great mobility. Fast reload. And versatile. And the cons. Inconsistent firepower and large weak spots. No real point doing the X-Factor here, get it, it's the first Abrams. Although it can't really make a strong lineup on its own, so it may be best to wait until you unlock the second one, or you could just take a few light vehicles along with it instead. Either way, the M1 isn't perfect, but it's still very capable. Next up, we have the M1A1, upgunned and slightly up-armoured. The turret cheeks have been buffed a little, some of the weaker guns in the BR spread can't get through it now, but the standard weak spots are still the same and remain unchanged. 
The extra armour has increased the weight by 3.7 tonnes, and as the engine is the same, currently all of the Abrams in the game have the same engine, it is a little slower, but not by much. The main change is the gun, the classic 120. And unlike the M1, this variant is much more reliable. It comes with stock heat at 480 max pen, and also has two dart rounds, M829 at tier 1 and M829A1 at tier 4. Both of these rounds are nicely effective, with the A1 version being a universal improvement. It adds around 100mm of penetration on shallow angles, and around 60 on harsh angles. So definitely main it when you unlock it, but the first dart will still work just fine. So I've been feeling bad about this segment of the video. The Abrams are these almost monumental tanks guarding the end of the line, but there's just not really much new that I can say about them. They all have their differences, but they mostly all play the same. Not completely, we'll get into that later, but they're not really different to the point where you need to consider an entirely new approach. So we probably won't actually be spending too much time on them. Some lower tier tanks, I feel, take pages and pages to work out the best way to use them. But here with the Abrams, there's just not really much more I can say, which in part is a good thing, as it shows there's nothing actively holding these tanks back. Anyway, back to the M1A1. Despite the bigger caliber, the reload still isn't bad, 7.8 seconds stock and 6 seconds aced, which puts you under the Russian and Chinese tanks and on par with the Leos and Leclerc, so it is sort of average here, but still relatively not bad. This combined with the increased weight does make it slightly less reliable for this hypermobile, hyper-aggressive style of gameplay, but not to the point where you can't do it, it's still basically how I play this thing. Effectively, you just trade off a small amount of mobility and reload for a much more powerful gun and better turret armor. Your cheeks still aren't immune though, so don't bank on them quite yet. I'd again definitely recommend looking over common tanks in the protection analysis with these rounds too. Again, I could do it here, but if I don't show a particular example you'd want to see, you'll end up having to look at it yourself anyway. So I always find this approach best. The M1A1 is definitely more versatile though. You can afford to be a bit more defensive as the gun is much more powerful at long range, and you're a bit harder to knock out hull down too, which adds to this even more. So sniping at range is much more workable, and playing aggressively is still reliable too. Some slight knocks in this area, but you can still definitely do it. Pros? Great mobility, great firepower, and versatile. And the cons? Large weak spots. Verdict! Whatever, get it, this Abrams is currently tied for the best in the tree from my perspective. Recently, almost every 10.0 and above tank got moved up one notch in BR. This tank, and the next, didn't, which currently makes them very effective. I like this Abrams a lot, because it lets you engage from a longer range a bit more easily, which opens up more possibilities on different maps. So for now, this one is absolutely worth picking up. I imagine this thing will be going up to 11.0 soon enough, but even then, it will still be good. Next up, we have the IPM1. IP is for improved performance, which checks out. Interestingly, this is the predecessor to the M1A1, which may seem strange as it comes after it, but it is justified. The IPM1 only has the 105, but it gets some good rounds. M833 in tier 1 and M900 in tier 4. M900 for a 105 with a max 5 second reload is great. It's not as powerful as the 120 and doesn't generate as much damage, but it's still great. And mobility is nice too. It's only 1.1 tons heavier than the first M1, while retaining the turret cheek buff from the M1A1. They are slightly different, I think the IPM1 has literally 10mm more protection, so they're basically the same. For this tank, you want to go for M900 as soon as possible. Easy to say, as it's a tier 4 mod and of course will take some time, but it's really what makes this Abrams shine. This is one of, if not the most reliably aggressive Abrams in the game, at least regarding absolute potential. The gun can let you down sometimes on damage, but that's really about it. You have the mobility and reload, and the cheeks can save you against some of the weaker guns. Its playstyle is basically the same as the first M1 for me. You have the mobility to get on the sides, which is your best environment, but you do still have a more powerful gun if you get caught head-on or have to engage at range. 
it's kind of an exact in-between from the M1 and M1A1, which kind of makes sense as it was a stopgap before the M1A1 could be introduced into service. So there's something about this tank, actually about all of the Abrams and loosely top tier tanks in general that I'd like to cover. Maybe this is an abstract thing to say that only makes sense in my head, but for this tank especially, you need to feel confident, because if you don't, you will probably end up in situations where it just doesn't work as well. As I mentioned earlier, I had something happen to me last year which has meant that I've lost a bit of visual fidelity in my right eye. I don't know if it'll come back, and I also don't really think this video is the best place to go into the details. The video is not about me after all. But I mention it because it has made playing the game harder sometimes, and especially top tier where you really need to be quick with spotting and identifying. Because of this, it made me feel less confident with the game for a while. I didn't think I could compete, so I noticed myself playing much more passively. I'd set up an ambush or snipe at range because I was apprehensive about not being able to spot threats in time in a situation where I was more vulnerable. I hope this doesn't come across as a backhanded ploy for sympathy disguised as Abram's advice, but I bring it up because it did show me that if you want to get the most out of these tanks, you need to go all in. Push in, hit that flank hard, and go as far as you can, because once you're there, your reload and gun will get you a lot of kills. When you're on your first push, there may be a part of your brain that starts saying, okay, you've gone far enough now, surely. Just quit while you're ahead and wait for them to come to you now. And for a while, I listened to this voice and I wondered why I wasn't doing very well. I was excited to cover the IPM1 again because I knew it was brilliant, but I wasn't able to make it work like I used to. After some time with a lot more practice, I managed to start pushing this thought out of my mind. I might not be able to see as well, but I can still see. I pushed past that apprehension, had a bit of confidence, and it started clicking again. Maybe this is something only relevant to me, but I'm not the only person in the world. Maybe there's more of you out there who have the same thoughts. If you're worrying too much about being hit, you will be, because that apprehension will reflect in how you play and passively put you in less competitive positions. I have the best games in this thing where I believe I'm not going to get shot, and in these games when I play well, I often don't take hits, maybe one or two, because I'm confident with my approach and end up in better positions, on the sides of enemies, etc. Armour at this tier is like a psychosomatic crutch. Relying on it will only slow you down, and you don't even need it. Maybe I'm talking out of bounds of what this video should be, but a lot of this game is in your head, it's your mindset. A bit of a tangent, but my dad really likes playing darts with his friend Marky from work. He's a really good dart player, and Marky, well, he's been letting himself down a bit. I used to watch them play every Friday, and poke Marky in the ribs if he was winning. My dad is someone who gets stuck in his head sometimes, and even though he's better than his opponent, he'll lose every time if he believes he will. And I watched this. Sometimes when he was playing, there was a point where I could see him decide that he'd already lost, and from that point, he always did. It's okay if this game makes you feel anxious sometimes, in whatever form that takes, whether it's performance anxiety or just general apprehension. But if you really want to succeed here, you need to have a bit of faith in yourself. Self-doubt is even more punishing here when the playing field is level. Players miles below your raw skill on a level 1 crew who've just bought the terms will take you out if you let them. Maybe none of this is relevant to you, but if it is, push in hard, keep moving, keep being aggressive. If you get hit, you get hit, but if you don't, you'll have a great time in the IPM1. Just make sure you know where you're pushing to. Holding W only works if you know where it's taking you. If you're someone that does feel like you get stuck in your head, try a few games where you just risk it. Pick a route to zoom down out of the way and just go for it. Maybe you'll die instantly and think this approach is terrible, but keep trying. Eventually you'll find the most consistent routes, and when it starts working, it'll keep working. You've got this. Pros. Great mobility. Fast reload. Great firepower. And versatile. And the cons? Large weak spots. Get it. We're breaking the mold now. We're off the rails. This tank is very, very good. 
it doesn't deserve to be 10.7. It's very powerful here. So in the future, I would imagine it going up to 11.0 with the previous one. But even if it does end up there, you don't need a down tier to do well. This tank is very capable. Maybe you prefer the more powerful M1A1 or the mobility and reload of the IP. Both are great in their own ways, so I'd recommend unlocking and spading both. Next up, we have the M1A1HC Heavy Common, which to me is really the least relevant version in the tree in the grand scheme of things. At 11.3, it's improved, but not really actively. Firepower is, for the most part, identical to the M1A1. The only addition is a situational anti-air round, which is quite cool, but not very usable. It's a heat FS shell with slightly lower penetration, but with a proximity fuse. It's also quite high velocity too, which helps with aiming. It's pretty useful against helis, it's good to carry a couple of shells, but I found it often doesn't one-shot. It will often cripple stuff though, so whatever you hit won't last long anyway. Apart from that, no change. It does have a couple of gimmick features though. Firstly, the dozer blade. This lets you dig out cover and make mounds to hide your tank behind. Though it's functionally redundant unless you want to snipe from the same spot at range and never move. So it's barely an upgrade. Equipping it does make your frontal silhouette a bit more vague, which can cause a few extra bounces. And it also doesn't increase the weight, so I often play with the blade on. It can make you a bit more conspicuous at close range if you're peeking, but eh, it's there. The latter is a soft kill protection system. This comes by default and is the little cube on top of the turret. This is intended to disrupt the flight of ATGMs, but it only works against older missiles. Vakirs, Hellfires, the ATGMs on the BMP-2M and Chrysantima all aren't affected. So basically every common missile. I don't think I've ever been engaged by a missile that this thing negated. It's nice to have it, it doesn't really bring any drawbacks, but it often doesn't do anything. Oh, just turn it off at night though. The primary advantage of the HC is the turret armor. The cheeks are immune to every kinetic tank round in the game from a frontal angle. This is nice as rushed shots will get caught here, though some ATGMs can get through. Generally though, the cheeks will be immune. This does however come with a hefty weight increase, at 4.4 tons heavier than the IPM-1. This does notably cut into its mobility. You're still fairly quick, but not as dominant as the previous models. So, other than being harder to kill, the HC doesn't add anything new. It has less active advantages as it's slower than the previous Abrams, but more passive advantages, you will bounce more shells. But it's currently two BR jumps above the previous Abrams. You will be in 11.7 and above matches almost constantly. So this tank is fighting the best of the best in the game right now, and all it has to show for it is an advantage that only comes into play if the enemy makes a mistake. This is quite a pessimistic view on it, as enemies of course will be making mistakes all the time and will hit your cheeks, but for being put in a more competitive environment, you want something more to bring to the table other than making the strongest part of your armor even stronger at the expense of an actual advantage like mobility. It's only 1.8 tons heavier than the M1A1, but still, you do feel it. So there's not really much I can say about this one. It's quite underwhelming and less offensively reliable. Sniping with it can be nice as it will catch poor shots in the cheeks, especially if you're moving around, but you will feel the lack of agility when compared to the earlier Abrams. You can still play aggressively though, nothing stops you, and it's generally where I choose to play it as well. But just don't expect it to be quite as agile. In short, a bit more capable defensively at range, and a bit less actively capable aggressively, but not to the point where it kills the playstyle. Pros. Good mobility. Good firepower and versatile. And the cons? Large weak spots. Verdict. I would consider this one, honestly. The main negative is that you'd want to be playing this in a lineup, and I don't think it's worth bringing the 10.7s up to 11.3. They're less reliable here, and honestly, neither is the HC. 
it still works fine, but you are always in 11-7 realistically, and will be fighting some tough tanks. In any case, as it currently stands, I wouldn't play this one immediately as you unlock it. Maybe save it for when you have a true endline lineup. So, next up, we have the M1A2, currently the penultimate tank for the USA. It's 11.7, the highest BR we have for tanks at the moment, so this is your first true top tier. It has a few upgrades that put it here, but truly it's not all too different from the HC. Armour is identical, the weak spots are just as weak. It's also half a ton heavier too, so mobility isn't better either. Firepower is the only area where this thing sees improvement. Firstly, it gets a commander sight with Gen 1 thermals. Personally, I barely ever use this, but it is at least there. The main advantage, though, is the top round it gets, M829A2. Regarding cold numbers, this is one of the best rounds in the game, losing out only to the Leo 2A6 on angled pen. It's very good, but really, Practically all the top tier rounds are functionally the same, in the sense that, in your case, your turret cheeks are immune to every kinetic top tier round, but the rest of your armour is vulnerable to every top tier round, which gives every enemy the same potential lethality against you. There are slight instances where this isn't the case across the board, but this largely goes for every common matchup you'll have. I don't bring this up to devalue the merits of the M1A2 in any way, the round is objectively good, in the same way that every other top tier round is objectively good. But the main point is that it's about the platform, not how big the number is next to your shell. It's very easy in this game to get caught up in numbers, especially when comparing similar tanks. But I genuinely believe you could shuffle the penetration power of every top tier round, then hide the stats of each round after the swap, and players would really struggle to work out which round was which through regular gameplay. It just doesn't really matter past a certain point, at least regarding the tanks and technology we currently have in the game. What I'm getting at is that this Abrams, despite having a great shell, is just the previous Abrams but scaled up to fight tougher tanks more regularly. It can't do anything new relative to the environment you're fighting in. The weaknesses of its armour are the same. The mobility is slightly worse, but functionally the same. The main advantage this brings you, and all other top tier tanks from their own perspective, is quite an important one though. It basically lets you click faster on enemy tanks, because you can afford to be slightly less accurate and aim more generally. This admittedly does help your mindset too, at least for me. Knowing you have a powerful round does afford you a bit of extra confidence while you're playing. For engagements, one of the most important aspects to top tier tanks is their individual reaction time window how long it takes for an enemy to click on them in a spot that leads to a critical penetration. The Abrams has one of the worst reaction time windows, actively and passively. The weak areas are very large, and it doesn't really have any other supplemental elements that work in its favour, in the sense that the Type 10, for example, has basically no armour, but has Gen 3 thermals and a 4 second autoloader. This increases its reaction time window by being able to exploit its enemy's reaction time window faster potentially. The M1A2 on the surface is quite average. That's not to say that it's bad at all, it's still able to compete as every tank here has a baseline level of ability. It's fast, responsive and has a great gun. Actively it lets you do anything, but passively it has no additional advantages that help you. It doesn't help you, but it lets you do anything and this is where you come in. This tank's ability is completely relative to you. There's very little hand-holding. If you know where to position and where to shoot, it's not like this tank won't work. If you play perfectly, you'll do just as well as any other tank around this bracket. But when the playing field is this level, you can't expect to play perfectly. Everyone in these lobbies will make mistakes. And so, the tanks that protect against mistakes the most will generally perform the best on average. Right now, tanks like the TAT BVM and the STRV PLSS are really strong, as on top of being a universal platform, their armour is great at catching rushed shots. And as every player won't be aiming flawlessly, they will generally survive longer and therefore perform better. You don't quite have the same level of luxury. Though, as you're mobile and have a great gun, 
you still have all the potential you need to perform. Aside from the weak spot, the M1A2 doesn't have any situational drawbacks. The Russian and Chinese lack of gun depression, the Challenger's lack of mobility, the Makava's reload, etc. The Abrams can still be a fun vehicle because it has no hard limits that will always negatively affect it. It's only limited by how competent your enemy is. So generally, it won't be the easiest top tier tank to play, but it still has a lot of potential in any situation and map. And this aspect alone is a worthy advantage. It's just not as shiny as Gen 3 Thermal's invulnerable armor, a fast autoloader, etc. And this kind of takes us back to the Shermans a bit, in the sense that what makes the vehicle work isn't readily identifiable just by looking at it in terms of cold numbers. Anyway, playstyle doesn't really change. You can rush and be aggressive like usual, or sit back and snipe. Sniping is more viable when compared to the previous models, as your hull down protection is good, the breach weak spot is small, and you can usually take a shot and survive. And most importantly, you don't need to be up close to make the gun work. This kind of spot will keep you alive, and your reactive mobility will let you reposition quickly too, although you are vulnerable to the ever-abundant cast while doing this. So it's still best to move after getting a few kills. If you are sniping like this though, try to position your hull side on to the cover you're behind. This way, if you know a shot is coming in, you can move backwards and forwards to throw off your enemy's aim and increase the likelihood of them hitting your cheeks. If you just have the hull pointed forward while you move, the weak spot's position doesn't change relative to the line your enemy is aiming on. Though, despite the mobility being much lower than the earlier Abrams, it's still viable to play in the same way, and loosely makes your weak spot less of a problem, or more of a non-issue. Head to head, you can be clicked on very easily, but being aggressive, rushing, and taking an enemy by surprise does give you a bit more time. If you appear somewhere an enemy isn't readily expecting you to be, there's a high chance of you spotting and shooting them first. Even if they do become aware of you, they're likely slightly panicked and have a higher chance of rushing their shots. And this is still where the Abrams is at its best. But due to the more limited mobility, it's not always easy to force this kind of situation on every map. Although, as the Abrams isn't limited by rough terrain or a slow reverse gear or anything like that, this is the playstyle I would recommend prioritizing where you can. On completely equal footing, in the sense of you and your enemies seeing each other at the same time, you don't have the best chance with your weak spot. So rushing or going down the flanks is really the strongest and safest approach you can take. Tanks are much more equal here in the head-to-head. -head. The specifics of your vehicle don't matter as much. It just depends how fast you can click accurately. You won't meet a vehicle you can't pen from the front. In this kind of head-to-head -head situation, you're not really employing your advantages. It's all dependent on your core skill. So if you want to get the most out of the Abrams itself, you need to focus on applying the mobility in a way that counters what you're fighting. In this game, mobility is the hardest aspect of a vehicle to beat. You can beat good armor with knowledge of your shell and knowing where the enemy armor is weakest. And this is a meme sentence. You can counter a good gun and having unreliable armor by not being hit. I really don't like this term, as it's often used in a reductive or condescending context. Telling someone to just not get hit isn't helpful because, okay, and how do you ensure that? You can't, not all the time, but you absolutely can play in a way that minimizes the chances. This sentiment is much less applicable in lower tiers where tanks aren't very fast, but in higher tiers, you have the ability to position in good spots a lot more frequently. Playing down these more aggressive routes and on the flanks makes you harder to counter from general positions. So even though you can play in any way you like with these tanks, always focus on rushing to power positions and flanking where you can. Aside from that, there's not really much else I can add. It's not the strongest MBT, but it actively has no flaws. You just need to find good spots and routes, and practice the best shots to take on your enemies. The tank is only as good as you are. I appreciate this segment may come across like, well, it's good, but actually it isn't. But in reality, it's great, but realistically, it's not. It's hard to speak in absolutes for vehicles at this tier. 
as when you break them down, a lot of them are, simultaneously, all powerful and all fallible. They're all tools that can perform a task, and so, at the end of the day, their potential is only as good as the person using them. While the view of the Abrams may be relatively weak due to the weak spot it has, it doesn't ruin the vehicle, but it does stop it from being the best in my opinion. It will never offensively hold you back, but you will always be easier to destroy. Aside from maybe hull down at long range. From tanks anyway. It's hard to finish this segment off as I can't really be conclusive here. I can't decide if the 1A2 will be a suitable vehicle for you. Maybe you want a tank with a smaller weak spot or a faster reload. Or maybe the Abrams' universal nature is enough of an advantage to make it fun for you. It's really worth spending some time thinking on it. Pros. Good mobility. Great firepower. And versatile. The cons. Large weak spots. I'll skip the verdict on this one, and the next tank too. This is the end of the line. Of course they're worth getting in the sense that if you get this far, why would you stop before the end? Which does make for a good question. So, for the current endline tank, we have the M1A2 SEP, which, much like the regular M1A2, struggles to really change much. Firepower is identical, with the same rounds available. It does, however, get a second generation thermal sight, which is a nice and welcome upgrade. Its other main feature is the Tusk Package, Tank Urban Survival Kit, which can be installed at rank 2. Honestly, the primary asset this brings is to make the tank look cool. That might be a bit cynical, but like the previous upgrades, it still doesn't fix any of the vehicle's problems. This package adds another 50 cal, some extra protection on the roof for the non-existent crew on the machine guns, and finally, the sides of the hull are covered with ERA. It's not too bad. It protects against 20mm of kinetic and 450 of chemical. In practice, one of the best things this offers is that it's a bit harder for autocannon tanks to penetrate you from the side when they're at a slight angle, although it doesn't make you immune. From the side, some heat shells can't break through the ERA, but as the turret is unprotected, they can just punch right through there instead. This ERA package only really offers incidental protection in the same way your turret cheeks do. They will catch poor shots, but at the expense of 2.3 tonnes of extra weight, bringing this Abrams up to 65.4 tonnes, all with the same engine it started with, and just under 10 tonnes heavier than the first Abrams. If you apply this package, you get no active advantages, only drawbacks but there will be those moments where it does help. So really it's a choice of whether you prefer a bit of extra mobility or an extra 50 cal and some more side armor. Personally, I don't normally equip it as the hits of mobility is pretty noticeable. So apart from that and the thermals, the tank is the same. To sum it up, like the M1A2, this vehicle can perform very well if you're confident with the game, but relatively will perform badly if you aren't. It can be more challenging when compared to other top MBTs with less prominent weak spots. I spent quite a while talking about how the Abrams fail to really do anything new the more they upgrade, and while this is true and does mean they all have the same core weaknesses, it also means you potentially have a full lineup of vehicles that are workable on every map and will always be able to perform. You can definitely find these tanks enjoyable but they're not the most dominant model overall. At this stage, the question really becomes less about should you get the M1A2s, and more about should you spend your time getting to top tier in general. US top tier isn't bad, but it isn't the best. However, due to how homogenous the top tier experience is, if you like the gameplay loop of this area of War Thunder in general, you probably will like what the top ranks have to offer. Ultimately, I can't answer this question for you, but I can give you my perspective, which is only relevant to me, but there might be some echoes that you can relate to as well. Personally, not just with America, but in general, I don't enjoy top tier in this game. I don't think it's objectively bad, it just subjectively doesn't align with what I enjoy about War Thunder. I'm not bringing this up just to complain about it, but for the reason that you might feel the same way I do, and if that's the case, you may be spending time and potentially money working towards something you won't end up enjoying. 
Again, if you really like top tier, this isn't any kind of personal attack on your enjoyment. If you love top tier, I can play the game in exactly the same way you do and still not enjoy it. It's purely subjective. So a big one for me is gameplay variety. This is a point where vehicles that perform specific roles reach a kind of peak in design, which makes them all very powerful, but also very similar. They're all very mobile, they all have powerful guns, they all have very strong sections of armor, and they all have very weak sections of armor. And these particulars don't really change. Of course, the degree of how powerful each of these aspects is on any given vehicle varies, but they can all basically do the same thing. They're strong in the same ways and weak in the same ways. This is good for leveling the playing field and ensuring that your vehicle has the potential to work in any given situation, but to me, every encounter ends up feeling too similar. You put your tank in the same strong power positions and you click on the same enemies in the same way. You're always using the same type of round and clicking on the same spots. Spending the time researching and spading tanks feels less interesting, as each new Abrams doesn't really do anything new. It just makes the strong points slightly stronger and other parts slightly weaker. And this basically goes for every primary MBT line currently. It all kind of feels the same. And here, where research and modification costs are highest, to me it really starts getting bland. The dislike I have of this homogenous environment may very well be a positive for some people. You can deal with anything with the guns you have. You have thermals to spot tanks easier, and you have a laser rangefinder to do the hard part of aiming for you. As I mentioned in the last top tier video for Russia, the main factors to success here are map knowledge, reaction times, and luck. And this more twitchy gameplay can definitely be appealing. It cuts out a lot of the fat and streamlines engagements. But to me, this has always felt like a weird twist at the end, gameplay-wise anyway, in that once you get to top tier, you almost need to unlearn a lot of the skills that got you there in the first place. Thermals help you spot stuff, the laser aims for you, and your cannon can take out anything reasonably easily. To me, getting kills feels less rewarding, and being taken out feels more arbitrary. The prevalence of casts as well is another big turnoff here. In any kind of game, I don't like dying without making a mistake, and with drones, helis, and laser-guided munitions from jets, it's never possible to guarantee your survival from these things while still having a meaningful impact on the match. Of course, every tier has CAS, but in the lower tiers, it's harder to use and is at least more predictable. You of course can't dodge a bomb, but you can position yourself in a way that makes you harder to bomb. In top tier, yeah, every tank has smokes and mobility, you can smoke yourself and try to find cover to hide behind, but aircraft have a lot of ordnance, and at that point, you're just micromanaging your own death. Losing your position on the map and paying SL for dying to something you have no audiovisual cue for until it's too late is not enjoyable. A lot of the flow of top tier almost revolves around you losing your vehicle. There are so many effective ways to destroy tanks from the air, so it's almost an inevitability. If you go into top tier knowing this kind of gameplay loop is going to happen, maybe it's not something you'll mind very much, especially if you do like using CAS, but it likely won't be an enjoyable experience. Top tier is less about keeping yourself alive through the whole match, and more about using a powerful lineup to go for the win. I personally enjoy keeping my tank alive for as long as possible. It's an element of the game I find satisfying to pull off, and in this environment, there's just so many additional elements that stop you from doing that. Another issue I have is the teams. Right now, this may change, top tier games are around a 10v10. Recently, some alterations were made to try and make the matches more populated, but it's been quite inconsistent so far. So right now, once you get a few kills, at least one third of the enemy team is gone, a few of them have jumped in aircraft, and there's around three to five tanks on the ground to shoot at, which leads matches to feel stale very quickly. There's just less incentive for players to respawn after they get taken out here, chiefly because of how universal and fast all of the tanks are. They can cover ground so quickly that if you get taken out early on, you'll struggle to get back to a good position as the enemy is already pushed up and effectively locked a large part of the map. And in that time that you're in the open leaving the spawn, Cass probably has its eyes on you. It doesn't end up always going this way, but it's prevalent enough to put people off respawning. To finish up these loose points, I don't think any of this is an objective problem. 
You can really enjoy top tier for your own reasons and still be completely right. Ultimately, it just isn't an area for everyone. If you enjoy the variety of vehicles, tangibly different playstyles, and really working out your and your enemy's vehicles, you probably won't like top tier as much. But if you like to use vehicles that at their core won't hold you back, you probably will like it. I still think you should at least give it a go. You might find that it clicks for you in a way that earlier tanks don't. I would just be wary of setting your heart and wallet on it early on. The worst thing is to invest a heap of time and feel obligated to play it, even if it's not enjoyable for you. In the future of War Thunder, top tier is going to see the most change, with more technologies and developments that may end up altering gameplay a lot. In its current state, I wouldn't recommend it to people who like to approach the game like I do, but in the future, I might find that with some developments, it really does end up working for me. So don't avoid it forever, whatever you choose to do. Just know that going in, it's a big shift from what came before, and whether that's a good or bad thing is really up to you. Something I truly believe with War Thunder is that you beat this game when you realise progression is arbitrary. There is no end. Unlocking the best tank won't always lead to the best experience. I think it's in our brains to want to get to the end of things, it's just how we work. But with this kind of experience, there's fun everywhere. Your peak experience may very well be top tier, but your peak could also be playing the Shermans, it could be props, destroyers, unlocking skins, or just playing anything as long as it's with your friends. Your goal should be having fun, and fun isn't how big the number is next to the vehicle you're looking at. Fun is relative completely to you, and in a game like this, it's easy to forget that sometimes. In the end, whatever your preference is for the game, just don't force yourself to engage with something you aren't enjoying just because you feel you have to. Anyway, there's still tanks to go, and maybe you'll like some of them. So, next we're moving on to our anti-air vehicles, and we're starting with the M247, the Sergeant York. Quite an infamous vehicle, and one that's changed a lot over the years. Armour and mobility are non-factors really, as they don't have much effect on gameplay. It's on the hull of the M48, so it has a bit of armour there, but the turret is only 25mm thick, so there's no real protection. Mobility as well, M60-esque, not too much to get into. Like basically every SPAA, it's all in the firepower. It comes with twin 40mm guns with a pretty nice fire rate, more than double that of the previous 40mm AAs in the earlier tiers. What puts this at 9.0 though is partially legacy BR, but primarily it's the final unlockable belt. Stock you get a mix of standard HE and SAP HE rounds. These semi-armor piercing shells only have 38mm of max penetration, but as they contain 262 grams of explosive filler each, you can overpressure if you pen something. But you can't really play it in the anti-tank role, as even from the side, some MBTs can barely be scratched. But if a light vehicle rushes your spawn, you can take them out usually without too much trouble. It's not impossible to go on the hunt for tanks, but in most situations it's not hugely reliable. Anyway, the final belt is full of M822. This is a VTHE shell, which essentially functions as a proxy shell. You don't need to hit your target directly, aim close enough and it will explode and cripple it. This combined with the volume of fire means you can knock stuff out very quickly with an accurate burst. To help you with this, the Sergeant York of course does have a radar, though it's not the best. You only have 8 degrees of upward search, which does leave a big dead zone. It's very sensitive to ground clutter as well. You can detect targets at quite a long range and lock them there as well, but your guns are only really reliable within around 2.5 to 2 kilometers. Outside of this, you can hit slower aircraft flying in a straight line and you can still knock out helis that aren't maneuvering, but apart from these easy targets, it can be tricky. A nice benefit though is that your shells are tracerless, so unless an enemy can spot the flash from your guns, the first volley of shells will likely take them by surprise. And with the proxy rounds, you only need one good burst. This stealthy approach is honestly great, as it gives the enemy much less information. It does mean aiming can be a little harder though, with how the lead indicator on the radar isn't perfectly accurate. But with the proxy shells, it's still accurate enough to work. The main issue with this thing though, is that it's only really good with these proximity rounds. 
and these are a tier 4 modification. Before that point, it's much more difficult to use. Anything you hit will get taken out, but agile aircraft are really hard to shoot down. And with helis at range, because of the lack of tracers, it can be really hard to connect your shots. So a bit of a double-edged sword there. Disadvantage when stock, advantage when spaded. The primary problem the Sergeant York has is the grind to get to this belt, and the aggressive contrast between its stock and spaded performance. A situational vehicle like this, at rank 6, where modification costs are high, isn't going to be generating the most RP, especially as its competence is based around a feature that only becomes available after you've almost finished the vehicle. It's really hard ultimately to say whether it's worth it or not. The performance with the proxy shells is great, undeniably, and much better than the previous AAs, but the process of getting to that point is unfairly tedious. Adding M822 to the third rank would at least help a bit, or maybe even adding one M822 shell into one of the previous unlockable belts. Anyway, for using it though, the best advice is just to make sure your first volley counts. If I'm engaging an aircraft, I'll almost always try to wait until around 2 kilometers to start firing. Helis can be engaged at a longer distance as long as their flight path is predictable. One of the worst things you can do in an anti-air is fire at your target too early. As soon as they know an anti-air vehicle is aware of them, they will not give you an easy shot. Also, currently, this thing has a bit of an annoying bug. You're forced to take two belts of different rounds, so even if you do have M822, you can only have it as half of your ammo pool. As far as I know though, this is a bug and will be corrected so that you can take the full load. I've also found that aiming slightly in front of the lead indicator tends to give you a bit more success, but a lot of it mostly depends on the angle. Another factor that's a bit annoying is that you only have a 12 times fixed zoom, which is a lot. It means you can see your target better, but as it is fixed, you can't zoom out if an enemy is closing in on you, which often makes it so that the aircraft and your lead indicator aren't in view at the same time, which makes aim correction a bit annoying. In these situations, I'd recommend locking and engaging in third person. Pros. Good anti-air ability. And the cons, poor anti-tank ability, poor long-range performance, and poor stock performance. Verdict? I'll have to go with a considerate here. It really is good when spaded, but I can't decide for you if the time you'll need to put into getting it to that point will be worth it or not. This anti-air won't be with you forever. There are much more effective options later on, and you will need them to deal with attack drones and the more advanced aircraft you will start seeing. But the alternative is not having an effective AA until you reach that point. If you're not inherently an anti-air player, it might not be an issue for you. If you like anti-air a lot, you probably will enjoy this thing once spaded, but the journey there won't be very fun. I'll round this one up a bit more in the lineup section at the end, but really, only you can decide if it's a worthy asset. Next up, we have the LAVAD, a very interesting vehicle for the anti-airline. It inherently is an anti-air, but it has the ability to do a lot more. Armor? Let's not even bother, you're perpetually vulnerable to everything. You may be able to take a poor shot and survive here and there, but not with any degree of agency. Mobility is pretty great, you can easily cruise in the high 40s and 50s off-road, and can comfortably hit 60 and 70 on-road. The max speed of 100 kph is reachable, but will often require more road than most maps have. It can also hit 18 kph in reverse, which is decent. But as it's wheeled, it does struggle a bit with making reactive maneuvers quickly. Regardless though, it's good. Definitely at the top regarding mobility this tier. Its firepower, though, is pretty varied. It comes with a stabilized 25mm, the Equalizer Gatling Cannon. It has quite a limited range regarding accuracy, and is also tracerless like the Sergeant York. You do have a tracker, so you can lock and get the lead indicator for aircraft, but you're only going to be getting decent results at close range. It's a pretty inaccurate gun. So, sadly, the last update nerfed the AP performance of this thing a fair bit. Initially, at 100 meters, the AP had 85 millimeters of pen, enough to get through the side of practically anything. 
Now though, it's been reduced to 62 at 100 meters, which is still enough to get through most light tanks, but it does struggle now to get through the sides of MBTs unless you have a good angle, which is a real shame honestly. Still though, the gun is good when it comes to tearing off barrels and tracks, and from that point you can still flank your target to get a perfect side shot. Stock, you also come with two quad pods for stingers, with a total of 16 missiles, which is pretty huge. Regarding the missiles, you'll have access to two types, the E-type stock and the unlockable K-type. These are identical apart from one feature, which is that the K has a 1 meter trigger radius, which is really useful as stingers can be quite unreliable. They don't have the greatest range, but within around 2 kilometers, they're pretty workable right now. You can afford to launch on slow targets like drones and helis from much further away, but for planes it's best to wait until they're close. Annoyingly, you also can't engage drones as they spawn, which can make playing as a dedicated anti-air a bit tedious. As you also don't have a radar, it's hard to spot targets sometimes. You do have thermals, Gen 2, which is nice, but as your minimum zoom is 8 times, it makes scanning the sky with thermals on a bit difficult since you can only get a small field of view. However, at tier 4, you have quite an interesting modification. You can unlock and equip a Hydra pod, which swaps out one of the two Stinger launchers. These are unguided heat rockets, which are most often found on aircraft. They have 290mm of penetration, and you get 19 in total. Not a huge amount, but it's still quite an effective weapon. Getting the aim down may take some getting used to though. They naturally arc slightly upwards and don't adjust with your laser rangefinder. But with a bit of practice, you can make good use of them at the closer ranges. At 10.0, this thing is not the most impressive in the anti-air role. It's very weak to drones and if your team has another contemporary anti-air, you likely won't be getting many kills in competition. It's good at knocking out scout UAVs and early helis, but as soon as a strike drone pops in and wants you out, you can't fight back. So this thing is primarily, functionally at least, a light tank with anti-air capabilities. And it's really nice that you can equip the rocket pod along with the stingers, as this still gives you 8 missiles, which you'll rarely use all of anyway. You can maximise your anti-tank ability while still maintaining your anti-air ability. So you should definitely keep this pod on once you unlock it. I'd also absolutely recommend going for the mobility upgrades as fast as possible, as these are the most important for the playstyle. This thing really is a rat. It's great at early ambushes and going along the flanks too. Whichever of these playstyles you choose largely depends on the map. Despite how fast firing your cannon is, you still don't really want to run into an enemy on the move. By the time you start spraying the barrel and firing the rockets, you've already been clicked on. Even against light vehicles, you need to be careful with your first burst. Like many light vehicles, it's great on maps that allow varied paths into the map. You can either fully commit to the flank and try and rush behind the enemy team, or if you have a slower start and hear MBT engines coming, it's best to wait in ambush for them to come to you. Especially now due to the penetration nerf, you want to be as close to the enemy as possible. Even at 500 meters or so, the accuracy in pen really starts faltering. You want to hit the barrel as fast as possible. So always aim to be close and stick to cover as much as you can. Especially when stock, it's a good idea to stay with your team and pop out when they need help. From the front, there's a lot of tanks you can't take out, but you can disable anything very quickly. If an enemy is distracted with your teammate or they fire and hurt your teammate, you can rush out and disable them. It's quite a fun way to play actually. And that's an important aspect of this vehicle. Getting kills feels satisfying. You're like a mosquito beating a giant. Because of the likelihood of meeting a tank you can't beat, you're not going to have hugely consistent results or carry a huge amount of games. But with the mobility and close range firepower, you usually will come away with a few kills and getting them feels really fun. You can sense the annoyance of everyone you take out through the screen. Even if you only come away with a few kills, it still feels against the odds in a way. So it's a nice vehicle to use and has a lot of applications in various situations. It's a fun one to play if you don't want to take the game too seriously, especially with friends. 
If you do run into an enemy head-on, I'd recommend firing the rockets along with your main gun into the barrel, as both of these together can blind enemies with the impact smoke, which may make them miss a return shot on you. Also, if you're disabling an enemy tank from the front, make sure to also destroy their machine gun if it's a high caliber. 50 cals shred your armor, so if you're fighting something Russian especially, take out the 50 on the roof too. Russian tanks in general actually can be very annoying to take out due to their stronger side armor. Point blank, you can't pen most of the side. Although, all of these tanks have a weak 20mm strip of armor along the bottom. If you aim as high up on this strip as you can, you will eventually set off ammo. In summary, the three main playstyles are going for a wide flank to get behind the enemy team, rushing in and waiting an ambush and then reacting from there, or staying with your team and playing support. All of these work well and it largely just depends on the map. In any case though, for all of these, it's most reliable on urban maps and maps that force close range engagements. I would prioritize playing it as support with your team though. The pen nerf hurt its ability to play solo, as now you often need to position yourself at an angle that's more flat, which gives your enemy more time to react to you. It's still possible to play this way absolutely, but it's noticeably less consistent. You're not always reliable as a solo vehicle, but you're always reliable as a support vehicle. A final point as well is that it's a pretty good choice for a second spawn. It's capable against close aircraft, and as most tanks will be more spread out, there's a higher chance of running into one from the side. Pros. Decent anti-tank ability great mobility, and versatile. And the cons, terrible survivability, and poor long-range performance for both ground and air. Verdict. I would get it, not specifically as your anti-air, but as a versatile light vehicle. It's not always going to work, but it's fun in lots of situations and will still be able to play its role when the main MBTs you have can't play theirs. It's fun and sneaky and a nice addition to your lineup. And as it's still considered an SPAA and not a light tank, the spawn cost is always cheap too. So not as good as it was, but still one you should check out, especially due to the current state of our next vehicle. Next up is our first true SAM system. This is the XM975, very similar to the Flarak Panzer I and Roland I for Germany and France respectively. The 975 is a pure anti-air vehicle, with only incidental ability against ground vehicles, so armor and mobility are entirely non-factors. For this thing, it's all in the missiles and radar. You get 10 in total and can use two types. Roland 1s and Roland 3s. The 3 is a universal upgrade on the 1, having a longer range, more explosive mass, it's faster, can pull more Gs, etc. And it's only a tier 2 mod as well, so it's easy to get the most out of this thing quickly. For ground vehicles, these missiles have a trigger radius. You're only able to take out extremely light vehicles or MBTs if you land the missile directly underneath them, but it's very tricky to do. So, like the LAVAD, SAMs were drastically changed in the last update. Rolands especially bleed energy much faster, and currently at the time of recording, it's hard to even hit a target performing slight maneuvers. I have a feeling these missiles will again be buffed, as right now they aren't that usable. I would prefer to hold this video off until these things get changed, but as things get changed all the time, I'll eventually be delaying this video forever. So, because this vehicle specifically is currently in a sort of flux, I won't spend too much time talking about it in its current state, as I really think it won't remain like this. Most of the footage I'll be showing is of the old system. When this gameplay is on screen, there'll be an asterisk symbol in the corner. But you really can tell the difference, they're barely usable in some situations right now. Since I don't know if the missiles will return to the old state, stay as they currently are, or meet somewhere in the middle, I will leave the 975 segment largely as it was before the missile changes. A lot of the points I want to make aren't directly applicable right now, but there are a lot of fundamental aspects that will stay the same, and I think this is probably better than rewriting and re-recording everything based on the current implementation just for it to fundamentally change again and for this segment to become even less relevant. 
Anyway, the core of SAM gameplay does seem simple on the surface. You lock aircraft, fire missile, take down enemy, repeat. But there are a lot of extra tactics you can employ. Around this battle rating, aircraft players are, quite bluntly, aware or unaware. Those who are unaware, you can really just lock and click. But an enemy that's wary of anti-air will be much harder to take down. I mention this in this way as there's a lot of depth you can go into regarding SAMs, but often you won't need to. Regardless though, I think it's good to get into the details and talk about the precautions you can take, as you can't really ascertain the competence of an enemy before you've done something to alert them. The first thing to cover is what information you're giving the enemy. A lot of aircraft at this tier have RWR, a radar warning receiver, and in game, this serves two functions relative to you. When your radar dish picks up an enemy with RWR, the aircraft will see that they're getting pinged, and once they're locked with radar tracking, they'll get a more direct warning showing where the lock is coming from. Some players just ignore this, but those who don't will make it very hard for you to take them out after this point. But you can counter this. The 975 has IRST locking, this is effectively a stand-in for optical tracking to make the system work in-game. So, basically, you have two types of locking available. Tracking radar and IRST. Tracking radar is on by default, and when this connects to an aircraft with RWR, they will get the ping. But, if you track with IR, they don't get a ping, and you still have a decent lock. It's also worth noting, not a lot of this is readily explained, your search radar is disconnected to both of these systems, in that you can turn it off and still use both types of tracking. Having the spinny bit on is not required to lock anything. So, for this you need some keybinds. You need to set one for your dish, switch radar slash IRST on or off, another to switch between radar and IRST locking, as well as your standard lock button. IRST is fairly workable and in many engagements better than your standard radar tracking, and I'd recommend using it against most targets. IRST has a lower range of 10 kilometers to acquire a lock, whereas the tracking radar has 16. However, currently the IRST locking doesn't seem to be hitting the max 10 kilometer range. Presumably this is an error, but it's really hard to say with everything at the moment what's intended or not. Another aspect to mention as well is that you can just fire with no lock whatsoever. Against certain slower targets, this is possible, but even small movements will bleed energy away from the missile when it tries to correct itself, drastically reducing its maneuverability at range. So it's good to keep locked to maintain this stability. If you really want to as well, you can set up a hotkey on your mouse to lower DPI, which will further smooth your movements. Another aspect to radar itself is the angle at which it can detect enemies. The 975 has 18 degrees of detection. A lot of smart cast players will often fly high above before engaging, so they can fire off guided munitions from this blind spot. If possible with your position, you can drive on angled terrain to tilt yourself up. This increases your detection area. A lot of the time it isn't necessary, but if it's there you might as well take it. Something else to mention is that your locks can be interfered with by countermeasures flares and occasionally missiles for IRST, and chaff for radar. But most of the time, if your target is quite far away, the lock should maintain. So, for engaging, it all depends on the target. For strike drones, you can just lock and fire at them once they get within your 8km missile range. They often can't perform maneuvers to break your lock, so you shouldn't struggle too much. Although, if you see a drone and it's outside your range, I usually hide behind cover until it gets a bit closer, as a lot of drone players will go for you if they see you. Once you spot it, keep an eye on it, and pop out once it gets a bit closer. If you lock with IRST, you don't have range information, but toggling between radar will show this, so you can use this for an indication of when to fire. For helis, it depends on their position. If a heli is hugging terrain or the horizon from your point of view, it's often best to wait until they're somewhat clear of cover. Helis like the KA-50 get a warning when a missile is launched at them, so you'll see them spam flares and drop altitude very quickly. If you miss them at this point, the pilot will get very cagey and become quite annoying to take out. So, go into these engagements thinking that you only have one shot. It's best to be a little patient and only fire when you know you have time to connect your missile. If a heli is clear of cover though, you usually can just point and click. 
One shot is generally enough to cripple one, even if it doesn't take it out instantly. I only ever fire two missiles if the heli is still able to fire ATGMs after the first shot connects, even if it looks like it's slowly going down. For planes, IRST is arguably the most important here. Planes are the most directionally agile, so it's important that you give them very little information. Most planes you'll meet will have RWR, so it's good to assume that every aircraft you fight will. I mostly fire on aircraft when they're flying straight towards the battlefield. They're usually flying loosely towards you from this perspective, which makes defensive maneuvers more difficult for them to make. You want to be launching on them around mid-range. At long range, your missile will lose a lot of energy when it's maneuvering, making it a lot easier to dodge. At close range, an aircraft is effectively changing their position faster relative to you, making corrections more abrupt and harder to pull off. If an aircraft does sneak in though, try firing when it's either zooming in to drop its ordnance or when it's zooming out to re-engage. Aircraft will usually be flying straight in these scenarios, so you should have a good shot. In general though, a lot of this will just come to you naturally with time. After some practice, you will get some intuition with it. At the start of the match, I usually have my dish up to detect any first spawn helis. Then I keep it down and turn it off and on periodically to detect new stuff coming in. Again though, you often won't need to micromanage to this extent. It usually works just as well to keep your dish up until you ping something, and then lower it again when you can lock with IRST. Another good tactic to employ to help this further is looking at the spawns for aircraft before you spawn in yourself. Clicking on an aircraft in your lineup will show you the spawn locations. So on some maps, you can just stare at these with your dish down and spot everything as it spawns. While you're sitting in the spawn doing nothing, it's good to keep an eye on the kill feed as well. If an enemy with a cap or a few kills gets taken out, they very well may be spawning in an aircraft. Finally, your positioning. Your radar, of course, can get disrupted by clutter, so avoiding a lot of trees and buildings is a good start. Trees are considered semi-transparent for radar, so you can still operate around them, but it's good to avoid too many. I would, though, put yourself around the proximity of some kind of vertical cover or a big defilade. You want somewhere to hide completely if you spot a drone outside of your range. Positioning yourself completely in the open gives you the best offensive ability, but it makes you very easy to spot and take out from the air if somebody really wants you gone. Spawns often have some cover like this close by though, so it's a good idea to stick around there. Although I wouldn't sit directly in the spawn, as commonly SPA will just spawn and not move, enemy drones and CAS will likely be checking this area first. So it's still best to find somewhere close by, but a little bit out of the way. Pros? I can't really do these right now, from how it was before, its anti-air ability was fantastic. Now, it's very poor. So, let's just say that the platform and radar have the potential to be good, even if it isn't right now. Verdict? Again, I can't really have a comment. Right now, I would avoid it, but it may completely change. It's not fun or functional to use. I'd even say the stingers on the LAV are more reliable right now. What a timeline we live in where that's a sentence. Anyway, I'm sorry I can't make this segment more conclusive, or currently helpful. If there is a drastic change, I'll put a little message or something in the description to briefly cover it there. So, if you're watching this video quite a while after it's come out, have a check there. It's unfortunately the best I can do right now. So, our last anti-air vehicle actually gets a bit of anti-tank power. This is the infamous ADATS. Recently, this was renamed to the XM1069, but it was previously known as just the ADATS, Air Defense Anti-Tank System. It's on the hull of the Bradley and has some pretty impressive missiles. It gets eight of these, and they're basically dual-purpose ATGMs with an anti-air proxy fuse. They have 900mm of penetration and travel very fast. The previous Roland 3 travels at 570 meters a second, while the ADATS nearly doubles this at 1,027 meters a second. The missiles also have just under 8 kilograms of explosive mass, so they do a lot of damage against both target types. They also have a max range of 10 kilometers, so they're fairly workable within the common ranges you'll be engaging in. The ADATS also gets a secondary, the same 25mm cannon found on the Bradley, 
but the fire rate is cranked up to 500 rounds a minute, more than double the standard fire rate. Its only tracking type is IRST, again a stand-in for optical tracking, and it doesn't get any radar tracking, so by default you won't trigger RWR when locking. Overall, the ADATS is very capable. It can fire all of its missiles one after the other and can actually guide more than one at once. So, if you want to ripple fire at two aircraft close together, or make sure that KA-50 you're aiming at absolutely will go down, you can. It also gets early thermals too, to help spot faraway targets quickly. Like the 975, this missile was changed too, but it still retains most of its controllability. It does feel different, but still functions close enough to how it did before. The missile is a lot more jittery, I don't know if it'll stay like this, but for now it's definitely still usable. It seems like these jitters are a bug, as in the test drive and custom battles they function fine, so hopefully it will be fixed soon. Anyway, despite the great versatile missiles, it's still a very defense-oriented vehicle. This thing is huge and fragile and can't fire while moving, and with how quick tanks are on the draw at this BR, if you drive out and meet something on the move, you won't survive long. Another issue with engaging tanks, especially from behind cover, is where the missiles are positioned. The gun is high above them, and this is where the sight is, so often if you're partially hidden, you'll likely accidentally slap one into a rock, which can hurt as you only have eight in total. The turret system is completely unmanned, with all the crew being in the hull, so you can take the odd shot into the face of the turret, but the missiles are an ammo rack, so if they get hit, you'll go up in one shot. A bit like the LAVAD, you can play as a sort of support vehicle for your team. It isn't hugely mobile though, as it's around three tons heavier than the Bradley with the same engine. But it's not unusably slow. You can still go for a flank if you have a good route in mind, but it's very high risk. You aren't exactly stealthy or fast, and if you get caught, you're out. You also need to make sure that you're not around too much cover, as the missiles aren't hugely responsive as soon as they're fired. And much like the previous missiles, if your target is close, there's quite a high chance you'll miss. Playing with teammates lets you avoid the brunt of fire, while still letting you poke out and fire off an ATGM or spray down barrels and tracks. Although, at this BR, you might as well just play the Abrams if you're looking to fight reliably in this environment. You can do it with the ADATs, but it requires extra steps to achieve the same result a lot of the time. Where I usually position depends on the map. Sometimes it's best to just sit and spawn and watch the skies for enemy aircraft, but if the map allows for a defensive position sort of midway between your spawn and the middle of the map, it can be a good idea to set up around here. Often you will get the odd tank come to you if they're trying to flank, and you will regularly pick up a few MBTs if your team is losing ground. Might not be the most thrilling gameplay, but it does work, and with some practice you can find some great spots for this. Much like the XM, it's important to try and stick around some kind of vertical cover. Any AGM will one-shot you, and as you don't have any smoke grenades, you can't hide if you're out in the open. Apart from that, the overall playstyle is very similar to the XM, although at this BR you will be seeing more aircraft flying high over the middle of the battlefield, like the MiG-27s. These will often quickly get out of your search radius for the radar, so make sure you check above you if you see any pings disappear. Your search radius by default is 10 kilometers, but with a hotkey you can extend it to 25. So if you think an aircraft is loitering around, flick between it from time to time just in case. For countering these aircraft though, I try to engage while they're flying straight above me. They're usually using the targeting site at this stage and will usually react far too late to your missile. Aiming directly upwards can be kind of difficult, so if an enemy is around this space, Try driving up against some rubble or a wall to get a bit of a better angle. It's often not needed, but it can help in these situations. Apart from that, the ADATS is a very nice platform. Relative to other top tier AA, the ADATS is less effective at engaging aircraft at long distances, but very good at engaging closer aircraft. The Pansir and Flarak are very powerful, but their missiles aren't that controllable at the closer ranges. The ADATS can engage here effortlessly, so even though it's comparatively lacking in some areas, and on the surface may seem lacklustre, in its sphere of effectiveness, it's very good. Overall, the ADATS only struggles against players who play their aircraft carefully outside of your range. 
and the overwhelmingly vast majority of people will not be playing like this. You will constantly have enemies in your range and you will be able to take them out nicely. But that's not to discount the frustration you'll have when being engaged by someone out of your range. I bring this up because it's easy to focus on range in a disconnected sense and base a negative opinion about the ADAT solely on that factor. And it is partially true, the comparatively lower range is a hard limit on its potential and some players will be almost impossible to counter. But when the absolute majority of people still operate within that range, it's only a drawback theoretically and not in practice most of the time. And that's the part that matters really. In most situations you'll be fine, but you will have to position carefully to account for players at longer ranges, despite how infrequent they are relatively. Pros. Good anti-air ability. Decent anti-tank ability. And good performance at close range. And the cons. Poor survivability and limited max range. Verdict? Get it, it's not the most universally capable 11.7 AA vehicle, but against most of the opposition, this thing will do fine. Its ability to fight tanks too is a nice plus, even if it's harder to employ aggressively. It works great stock, and overall will fill the need for an endline anti-air vehicle for the time being. So, Dropping down from top tier, we have the M60A2 Starship. Quite a fitting name. The A2 is absolutely a side grade, ditching the traditional turret and gun. It's equipped with a functionally identical analogue to the Sheridan with the same rounds. Firepower wise though, it does have a couple of upgrades. Firstly, it actually gets a laser rangefinder which makes using the HE and heat much more reliable than the Sheridan over longer ranges. The second aspect is sort of an advantage, but it's very situational and comes along with a disadvantage too. The Starship gets a commander sight high up on the cupola. You can aim with the sight. So, due to the arc of the shells and being able to control the missile in the sight as well, you can, at the longer ranges, fire from behind complete cover. Most maps don't allow you to do this, but in some situations it can be pretty fun to lob rounds across the map like this. However, it can't really depress much. The depression of the sight is less than your cannon, so in the sight, you can't fire your missile over a hill and then track below it unfortunately. But this brings us to the armour, which is hindered by this huge cupola. It's very weak and will fuse APHE. The hull is the same as the M60 AOS, so at 8.0 it's not too bad. It does inherit the same weak spot on the neck though. But the turret face itself is decently strong, and because it's quite an irregular shape it can be quite survivable hull down. Most Sabo and heat shells can still pen most of the turret, but as the crew are low down and fairly spread out it's very hard to one shot this thing. If you only take 25 shells, there's no ammo in the turret either which really helps this further. The thickness of the mantlet isn't uniform, sometimes powerful shells will bounce, sometimes weaker shells will get through. But in any case, you can afford to take a few hits when hull down without getting one shot, as the armour isn't very well defined and being hull down forces enemies to shoot at these undefined parts, this is the best spot you can be in really. On paper, this thing is much better suited to long range in regards to what it brings to the table. Being able to fire from behind cover, aim accurately with the laser and sit hull down are all advantages that only really fulfil their potential at this engagement distance. But I think pigeonholing it in this way is very limiting for what it can do. Despite being suited for long range, landing your shells is still quite hard. Despite being able to be laser accurate, even when your rounds hit they don't do the most reliable damage. At longer range, because of shell deviation, it's hard to be as pinpoint as you need to be. If an enemy is aware of you, it can be very hard to take them out. You have one of the slowest projectiles at this BR, so if you're sniping from say one and a half kilometers away, your enemy has just over two seconds to react to your shell, which they can do quite easily. Even if they don't manage to completely get out of the way, if you hit the edge of the hull or turret, you won't do much damage. So I would avoid the extreme long ranges. Because of the slow shells and the perpetually deteriorating accuracy of the shillelagh, why did I put so many words with that many syllables one after the other? 
the mid ranges to closer ranges actually end up being better for it, as long as you have some cover to hide behind. Something the Sheridan couldn't do was make good use of the HE round. It lacked the laser, and as it's so vulnerable, lacked the reaction time window needed to accurately aim the shell in a lot of engagements. Since the starship has a bit of armor and the laser, you can negate the negatives this round had with the Sheridan. But to make it viable, you can't be too far away from what you're fighting. Look for a spot in cover at around mid to close range. The HE shell isn't overly forgiving, but it can take out anything. It's one of the only shells at this BR that can overpressure, which really gives this thing an edge. But like we mentioned at the start, a slight miss will cause no damage. As you can now use the HE round more accurately, the heat ends up being much less usable. It was more viable on the Sheridan as anywhere you land will do some damage, whereas with the high explosive, there are spots that will do no damage, and as you couldn't be as precise, it wasn't very consistent. But with the laser, the HE does become a decent pick, and from my perspective, is better than the heat here. Although it's still good to take a few of the other ammo types too. Russian tanks like the T10 and T55s need quite a precise hit with the HE. Depending on the range, heat may be better for these tanks. When using HE, hitting the roof or bottom of the turret face will regularly one-shot. These are the spots you should aim for, but do be wary of volumetric. You have a giant shell, so if you aim too low on the turret face, it's possible that your shell will clip into the top of the hull and do nothing. Which spot is best really depends on what you're fighting. The bottom of the turret is usually the best bet across the board though. Unless you're fighting something with no armor, then you can just click. You can also shoot underneath tanks to one-shot them as well. It's a reliable one-shot, but it's a bit risky, as a slight misalignment will only cause track damage. For this shot, I usually laser the bottom of the track behind the front drive wheel. You want the round to punch through the weaker floor armor, so try to avoid just hitting the drive wheel itself. Oftentimes, this will cause the round to detonate too soon, and the damage will be negated by the stronger lower plate. So, aim to position fairly close. I can't give you a perfect range as it depends on the position you're in and the map you're on, but aim to play at least within a thousand meters of where enemies will likely come from, but ideally closer. Covering camping spots can be a nice location too. As you only need a cupola or a sliver of roof showing, you can knock these tanks out without too much trouble. Another benefit to this as well is that tanks in cover are less likely to move, if you're covering a wide open space or a transitional area, you're likely only going to be seeing tanks on the move, which will be harder to hit as the round is so slow. So try and cover positions where enemies will be a bit more predictable. They aren't used to being slapped with high explosive at this BR, so a lot of them will be more lax about having a tiny bit of turret showing. It isn't impossible to brawl though if you have to, you have a full stabilizer and armor that at least requires some enemies to aim slightly in order to penetrate you, but it still isn't that reliable. As the 8.0 lineup has some nice versatile tanks, you rarely need to take it out in these situations, but it can at least still work here if you have to. Also, as it does still have the same firing platform as the Sheridan, you retain the really fast turret traverse. It's the same speed as the Abrams, so at 8.0, you're one of the most reactive tanks at the battle rating, at least regarding firepower. In down tiers 2, being aggressive is much more viable. Your armor works, and the stab helps you stay on the offensive. So it can be effective here in the lower BRs. Before you get the laser, it's an approach you may have to take, but do be mindful of the slow reload at these ranges, and also your reactive mobility. Your side armor is very weak, so make sure you're constantly turning your hull towards where enemies are. This also does bring up an issue though. The laser is in rank 4, which means you need to play out of your elements for quite a while until the more reliable playstyle becomes viable. You can still play it at close range, it does have advantages over the Sheridan here, and you could still use the missiles hull down if you have a decent spot. But it ends up being extra work, and that's a factor too. It effectively takes more effort and time to get kills with this thing, Put the M60A1 in the same positions and it will probably do better, it at least won't do worse. 
In the lower tiers, high caliber guns have merits, you will destroy anything you hit. You still have a long reload, but it is justified to an extent. In this BR, anything can pen anything much more easily, so you don't need a giant cannon with a long reload to get that result. It only holds you back. So, to make this tank a viable pick, you need to go for those one-shots, and for that you'll need the HE, and a strong position ideally in cover that lets you watch over an active sightline. Otherwise, you might as well just play the regular M60A1. Pros. Good hull down survivability. And the laser rangefinder. And the cons. Long reload. And poor reactive mobility. Verdict. I'd consider it. I can't deny it's fun when it clicks. You do have your workhorses at this BR to do the standard tank stuff, but on those maps with strong defensive spots, it does have a place and is also quite satisfying to use, which is still a positive for it, I'd say. If you don't mind the grind for the laser, then you probably will have fun with it, but if you prefer the more conventional tanks, it can still be skipped. I still enjoy using it, but fundamentally, the issue with it is, is that there's rarely a situation where it's the best choice to play. Still though, it does have its moments. So, if you think you'll be sticking to 8.0 for a while, it's probably worth picking up. But I wouldn't go for it first. Next up, we have the final Tech Tree Tank this episode, the M1128 MGS, one of the Striker series of armoured vehicles which is definitely interesting in regards to its design and how it plays. This thing is more of a true light tank when compared to the Bradleys, but it still has its gimmicks. Firepower is the most interesting element. Firstly, as this is quite a modern vehicle, it has the clearest thermals currently for the US, which are much more usable than those on the Abrams. And it's also a tier 1 modification, which is great. The Striker comes with an auto-loaded 105 with a pretty great shell for its BR. It starts with the standard stock heat and M774 at tier 1, but it can unlock M900, which feels great here. The reload though is sadly locked at 7.5 seconds, which, much like the XM and the MBT-70, does hurt its ability to be reliably aggressive. On top of this, its ammo pool and ready rack are quite low. It can only take 18 rounds in total with 8 shells in the rack, which can catch you out. One of the major selling points of the Striker is that the design of the turret leads it to be very effective defensively. As the cannon is positioned above the hull, it's possible to hide this thing behind cover that can almost completely conceal it, making it very annoying to knock out. The gunner and commander are often still slightly exposed as most cover won't be completely perfect, but hitting their cupolas is hard at range and your survivability is great in these spots. You are vulnerable to large HE shells here, but against everything else, you'll commonly just lose your breach. The issue though is that these kinds of spots are deceptively hard to come by for this vehicle for a few reasons. Firstly, it only gets 5 degrees of gun depression, which is a real shame as it makes most hills off limits. The Striker is also a very large vehicle. You can park this thing next to a T-series tank and you won't even have enough gun depression to hit the roof. Most hard cover in this game is designed to be accommodated for by tanks of an average height, so for the Striker, you need to get a bit more creative with the spots you go for. If you find one though, this thing works very well. The gun is very effective with M900 at range, and from this position you're fairly survivable. The hull itself though is expectedly barely worth covering. It does have some heat protection, but not really enough to add any value. Any shot through the driver will pass into the gunner and one-shot you. There is some negative space in the hull though, so you can cheese some shots sometimes, but there's not really much you can do to force this. The Striker does have an unlockable armour upgrade though, which adds slats around the tank. These will disrupt heat shells if you angle slightly, but ATGMs and the more powerful Russian heat shells will still get through. This mod also adds just over 5 tonnes of weight, which really limits your mobility to the point where it's barely worth considering applying. Mobility-wise in general though, it's pretty good. On flat terrain, it's almost the same as the first Abrams in terms of cruising speed, but if you're on a slight decline or roll down a hill, the extra momentum will really push you forward. While good, the mobility is a bit less impressive at this BR, as this is when MBTs really do start getting very quick. 
You generally will still be faster than all of them, but not to a point where you'll be comfortably ahead of everything. It's much easier to be intercepted on your way to early game positions. So be careful with the route you take, especially when stuck. Defensively, the mobility is a little difficult as well. It can only hit 12 in reverse, which for this tier is quite slow. This tide with it being huge and wheeled can make certain movements tedious. Its reload is better than non-auto-loading tanks stock, but on a decent crew, everything will beat you here. This combined with a large size and poor gun depression make it notably less reliable in this zippy light tank kind of role. But it of course is still possible. You can play it like this to some success, but there are a lot of elements that hold you back. Currently, this thing is 10.0. There isn't a lineup here, and it isn't worth making one with a striker at the spearhead. So it mostly only has use at 10.3 and above with the Abrams variants. An issue here though is that overall, the Abrams can just do more. Their mobility is still great and their reloads are much faster, with better defensive maneuverability and gun depression. So the question really becomes, in what situation is it a better choice to play the striker instead? A lot of it depends on the map. Again, you can definitely play aggressively on the flanks, but your longevity here is often quite low. This thing is at its best when hull down in a power position, somewhere where you can cover a wide sightline. Since this thing is a light tank, you can always scout enemies too, which in a position like this can be very useful, as you have a clear sight, good thermals, and are very hard to take out. So if you like spawning Cass, this one can help there too. If you're playing the striker out of cover, you're losing out on its primary advantage. The Abrams can often do more here. I am a bit wary about completely pigeonholing it into this more consistent defensive playstyle though. You can just drive to the flank and click on stuff. It's a bit of a dice roll, but as always with these kinds of vehicles, it can pay off. Effectively, it's a bit like flanking with this thing while taking into account its disadvantages can land you anywhere between a 1 or a 6 but playing it defensively guarantees you a 3, if you know what I mean. Personally, I only take this thing out when I'm on a map that I know has a position to accommodate for it. This is where its advantages align and where you have the most reliability. You need to justify spawning it, so you need to have a good position in mind. Look for low defilades, rubble piles, or windows or openings on urban maps. These spots can often work due to the size of the striker, I would also recommend taking it out solo into custom maps and just drive around to experiment with certain positions. Working this out in live games on the fly will lose you time, and at this tier you need to set up as quickly as possible. Try to have as little of your turret visible as you can. The cupola is roughly in line with the block around the barrel, so it's not possible to completely hide it, but you can still make it very difficult to hit. If you're engaging at long range too, it's possible to back up slightly when you see the enemy firing. This is hard to do as rounds travel much faster, but you often can just get the cupolas out of sight by the time the round hits you. It often can find a nice spot on a lot of urban maps too. These are commonly filled with rubble and openings that let you position very well. You do really want to avoid knife fighting on these maps though, as the hull is large and the turret is at the back. If an enemy is aware of you, it's very hard to maneuver or peek them without them being able to hit your hull first. Just try to find a sightline to cover that has perpetual traffic. Much easier said than done, but it is quite important, as I found it's tempting to just sit behind any kind of perfect cover you find, the perfect cover being the goal rather than actually just being somewhere useful. So keep this in mind too. Sitting at the back of the map with only your barrel poking out is great, but not if you only see one enemy the entire game. Definitely play around in a custom game, just listen or watch something in the background, zoom around in arcade, and make notes of the spots that work. I'd recommend anywhere that covers a cap, or a common route into a cap. Pros. Good mobility. Good firepower. And great hull down performance. And the cons. Poor survivability out of cover. Low gun depression. And poor stock performance. Verdict? I would consider this one too. I like it a fair bit when spaded, and it definitely has its moments, but as it's currently the endline vehicle, it will take a long time to spade it, and this is a problem as it's already a relatively niche vehicle in a very competitive bracket. It's not always going to be on a map that caters to it, and it only really starts shining once you get the Laser, M900, and the last mobility mods, which are all at tier 4. 
you could just go for the Abrams line and have a nice lineup of tanks that are almost universally workable. It's difficult as this thing can be great in the right situation, but as which map you get is largely out of your control, you can't really set your heart on spawning this thing, otherwise you will find yourself out of your element. If this thing's niche seems very appealing to you, you will still likely enjoy it, but it is a lot of work to get it to a competitive state, and honestly, I don't know if the grinding required is justified. This one, I'll leave to you. Next up, we have the first of two squadron vehicles, and we're starting with the peculiar M901. On the hull of the M113, it's barely armoured, and it isn't that impressive mobility-wise either, but the firepower is very unique. This thing can fire 10 of the improved Ito ATGMs from its dual launcher. And due to the elevated position of the launcher, it offers quite a few unique engagement opportunities. This thing can fire from behind total cover, and it also has the most gun slash launcher depression in the game at minus 30 degrees, which means you can kind of play this thing anywhere. Steep hills, rubble, etc. There's lots of areas of the map you can use that other tanks can't, which can make this thing quite fun. It also has thermals too. The missiles are pretty great damage-wise for 8.0. They do have a lower explosive filler than the regular tow missiles, but have an extra 200 millimeters of penetration so they won't struggle with anything, and are still workable in a higher tier lineup too. Currently though, in addition to the missile issues in general, it does have a bug where the missile doesn't follow your pointer correctly, but this should hopefully be fixed soon. It's a bug that's popped up before, so hopefully it shouldn't be too long before it's back to normal. So, as this one is a high tier squadron vehicle, it's going to take a while to unlock at 400,000 squad RP points, which on average will take a fair few months. This thing does offer a unique playstyle though. 8.0 is extensive and you have a lot of vehicles to choose from potentially, but the ability to fire completely from behind cover is still nice. This is a good advantage as well as it's basically up tier proof. The thing that makes this an effective vehicle will always be effective. Map dependent of course. It's not as versatile as the Bradley which can to an extent perform this thing's role while also being able to do much more, but the missiles the 901 gets are much more powerful, and still, really can't knock its ability to fire from behind cover. I do like this vehicle, but you do have to be a fan of very defensive playstyles to get the most out of it. It can't fire on the move, and if you hit 25 kph, the launcher folds back, and once it's folded fully down, it takes around 8 seconds to unfold and point forwards again. So you do need to be very careful where you choose to play this thing, and especially when moving from cover to cover. The M901 mostly ends up being a backup vehicle. When you don't feel confident with the rest of your lineup, you can fall back on this thing. It can be fun, but in any case, I would wait until the missiles see some improvement first. There's a fair few interesting squadron vehicles here, and despite this one being pretty interesting too, it currently has the least usability. So keep an eye on it, and maybe consider picking it up down the line. In the meantime though, this thing isn't our only squadron ground vehicle. So next up, we have the M1A1 AIM. This is an Australian version of the Abrams, and it's fairly competent. Cheek armour is ever so slightly different to the HC. It's about 10mm weaker, but functionally it's the same. Firepower is the real difference. It gets Gen 2 thermals and a new round, KEW. This is very comparable to M829A1, but it's slightly worse, though not really to the point where it functions differently. I do enjoy it more than the HC, mostly down to the thermals. Stock though, it can be kind of rough as you don't get the dart round in tier 1. It's in tier 3, which at least means you get the best shell before you reach tier 4, but until you get to that point, it is difficult with only the heat. Ultimately, it is better than the M901 as it has a lot more applicability and longevity and will be a perfectly fine tank to use at top tier. But, I know it's tempting, but if you aren't yet at this tier, please don't just buy it. 11.3 is basically top tier, and if your first top tier vehicle is this, stock, with no lineup, you will not be having a lot of fun. If you have no interest in the 8.0 lineup, definitely focus on this one. It's 540,000 points, which is a lot, but by the time you get to this tier from the bottom, you should be fairly close to getting it. It is tempting to take that shortcut, but you get no value from doing it. You don't need to get this tank earlier than you otherwise would from playing regularly. 
Like the 901, I wouldn't say this vehicle is necessary for making a top tier lineup. I still quite often use the IPM1 up here over this thing as it can offer something different, but the more the merrier. If you play the game enough in a squad you will eventually unlock it, and it will do its job fine. It wouldn't be a mistake to pump research into it. So if you want an extra Abrams, or you're Australian, or both, go for it. First for our event vehicles we have a pretty old one. This is the Makava Mark 1, and its inclusion here predates the Israeli tree by a few years. It is different to the Mark 1 in the Israeli tree though, and is currently the Makava with the lowest BR. Compared to the Mark 1B in the other tree, this Makava loses thermals and the laser warning receiver, but is offensively still the same, with the same gun handling and the M111 dart round. I like the Makavas, they're fairly unique as far as MBT designs go. They're a bit more defensive as they're very heavy and comparatively slow, but that kind of suits me. They're fairly survivable when hull down, and having the engine in the front further helps to soak up some damage from time to time. They're not immune by any means, but their survivability is nice. It doesn't really have a lineup itself at 8.7, but it's still a nice vehicle on its own. This one was a reward for the Battlefield Engineer crafting event from 2019, and is currently on the market for 80 Gaijin coin. It's still relatively cheap for as old an event vehicle as it is, as coupons for it sometimes appear in those SL loot box things. Still though, it's not a premium and a near identical, better copy can be played for free in the Israeli tree. It's not necessary for any lineup, so I wouldn't go for this one. You can get a lot of nice premiums for $80. Next up, we have the Makava Mark IIb. This is almost an exact copy of the 2B in the Israeli tree. Functionally it is, but the 2B here gets some extra composite armor on the roof and an extra 50 cal. Woo! The 2B is really nice. It has some armor improvements, thermals, and the laser warning receiver. This gives you an alert if you're being lased and the direction the laser is coming from. If this is coming from an aircraft, this gives you more time to smoke and hide from the incoming missile, which adds a bit more survivability potential to an already survivable tank. This one was the top reward for Operation Frost in 2019, and is currently on the marketplace for 110 Gaijin coin. It is a nice vehicle, you can start to consider a 9.0 lineup with it, but it's still too expensive for what it is. You can get a lot in this game for that amount, and as, let's be honest, an identical version is playable for free in the Israeli tree, so you're much better off going there for Makavas anyway. If it does end up tanking in price for whatever reason down the line, it is nice to have it in this tree, but it's not a requirement and not worth it for now. Next up we have the XM8, a tiny light tank and really one of the last traditional light tanks. Most smaller light vehicles around this BR transition more towards autocannons and missiles, while this thing keeps the old formula. It comes with an auto-loaded 105 that can use a couple of introductory APFSDS rounds with a fixed 5 second reload and early thermals too. You can also equip the level 3 armor package, which looks kind of goofy and is functionally useless. This mod adds composite blocks all around the tank, which barely help to negate any heat rounds, all the while adding over 6 tons of extra weight, which really makes the tank kind of sad and removes its main advantage. Without it though, it's pretty nippy and responsive, but these kinds of tracked light tanks slowly start getting outclassed around this BR. Its max speed of 72 kph is hardly bad, but you will be meeting MBTs around this battle rating that almost beat your speed off-road, so functionally it does struggle in its role and doesn't feel overly consistent to use. This thing was a reward for April 2021's crafting event and currently sits on the marketplace for 100 Gaijin coin. A bit too much for what it is and not really worth picking up. It's a cool vehicle but doesn't feel very reliable and most MBTs can offer more. It would be nice to see this thing get an upgraded round at some point to make it stand out a little bit more, but even then, as the price will just keep raising at this point, it probably won't be worth it. You're much better off getting some nice premiums or talismans for that price. Next up, an even goofier light tank, this is the CCVL, Close Combat Vehicle Light and functionally very similar to the XM8. Its reload, thermals, turret traverse, gun depression etc are all the same. It does have a slightly more powerful engine with a slightly higher weight, so mobility ends up being very similar as well. 
It does get M833 though, which does let it work quite well at 10.0, although it's still not hugely reliable for what it is. Wheeled light vehicles and IFVs still have more to offer. But the gun works nice, and in a good spot you can do some work with the autoloader. For me, it does work better than the XM, but it still isn't overly impressive. This one feels like it could have been in the tree, as it kind of makes the XM8 feel less special. This one was another crafting event reward from the overpowered event from summer 2022, and as it's a much more recent vehicle, it's currently much cheaper than the XM at 45 Gaijin coin. It's a usable vehicle and can still work beyond its BR, but you don't really need it. It's a very different light vehicle than the Striker and Bradley, but those two offer somewhat unique advantages and playstyles, whereas this thing doesn't really. You could somewhat justify getting it at this price if you really like the look of it, but it's just an event vehicle and you'd be better off getting a premium instead, especially when this thing inevitably does raise in price. If you really want to get it, get it soon, but it's not worth spending a lot of money on. Next up, we have the TCM AGS. Another light tank event vehicle, but this one is pretty unique and really nice. Like the Striker, it has an unmanned turret, but on the AGS, the crew are much better protected, being positioned almost entirely in the hull, with their cupolas being much harder to hit. It's also pretty tiny and has 10 degrees of gun depression, so it can utilize a much greater area of the map when compared to the Striker. Like the previous two lights, it also has a 105 with a 5 second autoloader and early thermals. It only gets M774, but the gun system more than makes up for it. It does only have 8 rounds in the ready rack however, which can bite you if you're in a good spot. But in the right location, this thing can be really obnoxious to take down, and it's honestly pretty fun. Mobility follows the same trend of improvement too. It's half a ton lighter than the CCVL with an extra 25 horsepower, so you're more than capable of finding good spots quickly. This thing was a reward for Operation Winter 2021 and is currently on the marketplace for 95 Gaijin coin, which is a shame as it's a fun one and not really worth it at this price. Of course, fun is relative and all that, and maybe you can justify forking out the money, but I'd always recommend going for premiums as they have much more value as products. If you do think this one is in your price range though, you'll definitely have fun with it in the right spot, but it's still not a requirement for any lineups. A bit expensive, but up to you. Next up, we have the M60 AMBT. This is a Turkish modification, and is currently the most capable M60 in the game. It has a 1200 horsepower engine, which finally gives this platform some mobility. It barely has any armor though, and is still a big tank so survivability isn't a strong point. No ammo in the turret though, so that's a plus. The main selling point is the gun. This has a 120 and fires the same KEW round the M1A1 AIM uses, so it's really nice for 9.7. Turret Traverse is also improved to the level of the Abrams, so it still stacks up really well. It also comes with Gen 2 thermals and a 25mm cannon on the roof, which is rarely used in combat, but it's still quite cool. It fires effectively a mini heat shell, which can pen 36mm, so you can use it to hassle some light vehicles from time to time. This one was a reward for World War Mode Season 3, Road to the West, and as it was only given out in coupon form to high performing players and squads, it's currently at 300 Gaijin coin on the marketplace, which despite its uniqueness and nice performance, is absolutely not worth it. New coupons have snuck out from time to time, so maybe the price will go down at some point in the future, but it would take a big drop to make it worth the money. For our final event vehicle today, we have the Macava Mark III D. The D version of the Macava is currently unique to the US tree, with Israel only getting the B and C version of the Mark III. The D, in short, is a bit heavier, and gets some extra composite armor on the turret sides. In general though, it is a nice upgrade. It has an improved 1200 horsepower engine and a 120mm gun, which can fire a very nice round for 10.7. Although, the reload is quite long stock at 8.7 seconds. All of the later Macavas share this reload speed, and it would actually be nice to see it brought down a little bit, just so it can be in line with the Leo and the Abrams. This one was a reward for 2020's Strategist crafting event, and is on the market currently for 155 Gaijin coin. 
Again, it's a very nice tank and does fit well into the lineup you have at 10-7, but it's still too expensive for what it is. It's more unique and usable than the other two Makavas, and the gun really does feel nice to use, but I still wouldn't recommend spending all that money on it. You can get a lot more value elsewhere and play a very, very similar version in the Israeli tree as well. So, finally, we have the premiums available at this tier, and we're starting with the XM1 GM, General Motors. This was one of the prototypes for the Abrams, so it shares a lot of visual and functional similarities. Firepower is very similar to the Abrams. It gets early thermals and the same turret traverse speed, but loses the top round, only having M735, which for 9.3 is... Fine, it's not impressive, but it's good enough. In up tiers, you can't just click aimlessly, you will need to be careful, but you can still deal with anything. Mobility is very, very good. Better than the Abrams. It's three tons lighter while having effectively identical engine power. Off-road, you can comfortably stay around the 50 mark and turn and maneuver quickly. It can also hit 42 in reverse as well. It does have suspension control, but only up and down like the XN803. Armour is not very reliable, but similar to the MBT-70, in that it's decently protected from autocannons. The sloped upper part of the hull will often bounce, and sometimes the turret can catch shells too. There's not really much to go into on the fine details though. You are still effectively vulnerable to pretty much everything. Much like the Abrams, it's about how you use your speed which you can do very, very well. It sadly doesn't have the insane reload of the Abrams being at the average 8.7 stock mark, but it's still a very mobile and workable tank. However, the GM is only one of the two Abrams prototypes. There's also the Chrysler model, which is a bit different. This one is an exclusive to the Xbox. There's no way to get it on any other platform, so I can't show it to you myself. But, as I have one friend who owns an Xbox, they have thankfully lent me some footage. This was provided by Scarlet, you can follow her on Twitch, she streams War Thunder quite regularly, and I think she's one of the only content creators who play on Xbox. So, if you want to see some live gameplay, give her stream a look. She can probably give you some more perspective as well. If you are on PC though, you can look at it yourself in-game and even test drive it. If you go to the wiki and log in with your game account, there's a button that will show the Chrysler in your hangar. The Chrysler is one notch lower in BR at 9.0. It has a lower top speed, but the weight and horsepower are the same. So for regular traversal through the map, they're very similar. It also has a slightly lower turret traverse speed and loses the suspension control. Its survivability is a little better, but I think that's just because they're comparatively much rarer and most people don't quite know where best to shoot them. Realistically though, they are again very similar. The survivability of both XM1s is pretty nice actually. If you only take 20 or so rounds, like the Abrams, the hull is free of ammo. They also both have blowout panels too. They both have differences, but they're close enough in ability to judge together. I will just say XM1 going forward, but I'll be referring to both of them effectively. The XM1 is still good. The landscape has changed a lot since it was introduced, and many more powerful tanks have been added in its bracket, but it can still perform well. Its mobility is incredibly effective, which will let you get to some good positions quickly. And from these positions, the gun is still capable. It doesn't have much longevity though. When deliberately up-tiered in later lineups, the gun does start to fail. It's not unusable and will still be a good backup, but you don't want your $60 premium to just be a backup. This vehicle makes a lineup around 9.3 much more solid, which is nice as the premium is unique and does add something to your game experience. So I would say the XM is a good pick if you want to stay below the high BRs. But there's a couple more tanks to look at first. So before you make any decision, let's give them a look. Next up, we have the M1 KVT. This is a very recent addition and is effectively just a viz mod of the M1. It's the M1 Abrams, but with some cosmetic elements applied to it, in order to make it look more like a Soviet tank. It's quite interesting. 
KVT is Krasnovian Variant Tank, which was a fake country made up for use in trials. In real life, M1A1s were used for this, but here, likely to keep the BR lower and out of top tier range, it's the regular M1 with the cosmetic carried over. So, sadly, those blocks on the hull and turret aren't ERA, they're just there to simulate ERA so they don't have any physical model. The only additive element of the Viz mod that changes things are the barrels on the back. These do get in the way of your turret traverse. The Viz mod, however, is optional so you can turn it off and have a regular M1. But there is one more functional change this brings. The Viz mod removes your side skirts. The composite side skirts you have are quite good at negating heat and some ATGMs if they land on a bad angle, and they do help against autocannons too, but they're also fairly heavy. So if you have the mod on and remove them, you shave off half a ton of weight, effectively making this the most mobile Abrams in the game. Not by much, of course, but still, this is the fastest you've got. Aside from that, everything is exactly the same. So, is this Abrams worth it? Much like a lot of elements in this video, it's not a black and white answer. It's the same price as the XM1, so it's on equal footing there. Both of these options have their strong points. With the XM, you're fighting weaker enemies more regularly, and can use it to form the backbone of a lineup around 9-0 and 9-3. The Abrams will likely be a bit harder if you're newer to the game, as it can see up to 11-3 but it overall has much more potential with the mobility and reload. It works better in up tiers too, and can be used to better effect in more lineups later on. So its longevity is better. And for a product, that is a strong advantage. You're paying for it, so you want to get the most out of it. And on that basis, I do think the Abrams is a good choice. It's great at its BR and a better backup when you progress further down the tree. So throughout the game, you will be able to get more use out of it. Disregarding their performance as vehicles in the game, these two tanks have different appeals as things you can buy. And because of that, I can't really say which one is better. Because here, better is subjective. Personally, I would buy the Abrams as it has higher potential in games and can potentially do more, but the XM1 is in a more comfortable BR bracket. Enemies are less universally effective, so if you're not as confident with maps and enemies, you will probably end up doing better with it. As these tanks don't have hard drawbacks that impact how to play them, how good and fun these vehicles are is reflective of you and what you can do with them. Maybe you own both and have a strong opinion on which is better, but it's only really better for you in the same way I would pick the Abrams. You could choose the XM and still be right in that sense. I would not buy into this tier until you play and unlock the rest of the tree. The grind at tier 6 and 7 is when it starts getting hard. Before that point, it is faster, so you can get away with using talismans and a few fun low tier premiums to help you get there. Before you decide to buy either of these, please do wait until you get a taste of the gameplay first. These tanks are expensive, it's a big commitment. So only commit when you're as sure as possible that you need one. I think overall, if you're not someone that can just throw money at things, you don't need one of these tanks. Get a nice rank 4 premium to earn SL with and use talismans at this BR to grind with instead. That way you can effectively grind with any vehicle you like, and could even just talisman the M1 Abrams in the tree and get basically the same result as the KVT in terms of RP income. With a talisman, their RP gain is identical for a fraction of the cost. I appreciate that talismans are less shiny and cool than premiums, but don't discount them. They really are good value. Anyway, sorry that I can't really be conclusive on this one, but we do actually have one more premium left. Finally, we have the M1128 Wolfpack. This one is pretty simple. It's entirely identical to the regular Striker, but can't mount the armor package, doesn't have the top round M900, and is one BR notch lower at 9.7. It does have some cool camo netting and chained tires, but these are purely cosmetic. It doesn't have extra traction or anything, sadly. 
The wolf pack is 9,090 golden eagles, which is roughly about $50 if you buy the 10k GE pack. This makes it $10 cheaper than the XM and Abrams, but you don't get the 2k golden eagles and two weeks of premium, so it's kind of a worse deal. Compared to the other options, I don't recommend this one, at least relatively. The issue it has as a product is that there are some maps where it just doesn't work effectively. The size and gun depression hold it back, and if you're paying for a vehicle, you want one that's constantly usable. You can't choose the map you play on, and as that's out of your control, you will end up in situations where you can't perform effectively. I still wouldn't say never buy it though, it does have some good features. It works beyond its BR and has a few forgiving elements to it. If you're a beginner, the high quality thermals will help you spot tanks easier, and the weird artificial survivability it has will probably help you sometimes too. So if you've already bought it, no problem, you haven't made a mistake, I just think it's the least usable out of the options you have. The lower battle rating is nice, but you don't really have a lineup for 9-7 so you'd likely just be playing it with the Abrams anyway, and as it loses M900, the premium is objectively less capable at the expense of a BR advantage you can't even really utilise. You could still play it on its own, but you really shouldn't be doing that anyway. Lineups are always important. Still, it can be fun, and with vehicles like this you will always have some level of success with it, but overall its potential is lower. If you can get it on a big sale, it wouldn't be a bad tank to pick up, but it does lose out to the XM and Abrams. They're both a lot more versatile and overall let you do more, and as the more you do dictates how much RP and SL you make, those are the vehicles you want to go for if you're set on getting a premium. Next up, we have the CAS options I'd recommend for the BRs we've looked at. I don't think you should get all of these, they're just what I would generally recommend. So, we're starting off with the F9F2, the Panther. This is a fairly nice naval jet and what I'd use for 8.0. It has quad nose-mounted 20mm cannons, so it can strafe weaker enemies easily, and can carry a nice set of large and small bombs with separate drops. So, it has a fair amount of potential. It's also decently manoeuvrable, and can hold its own against enemy aircraft as well. All around, it's a nice plane and still usable clean wing 2 if you lack spawn points. Definitely a strong one to start with. Next up, we have the AH-1G. This is actually an aircraft I don't recommend but would still like to talk about. This is the helicopter you get by default, and as it's 8.0, it's quite a tempting pick. But the issue is that it only has closer range ordnance, dumb fire rockets and 40mm grenade launchers which are quite good at taking out tanks if you hit the roof. However, because it has to fly close, it's incredibly vulnerable. BMPs, Marders, anything with an autocannon will quickly destroy you. The AH-1G can be great if you aren't contested, but if you are, it will rarely perform well, and will often not justify the spawn cost. It overall has quite low potential, and its ability to perform is too dependent on the vehicles the enemy has fielded. It just doesn't give you enough agency to be effective, to the point where I'd recommend it. Next we have a squadron vehicle, the A4E Early. This one has a fair bit of potential. The main selling point is the five guided bullpups it can carry. You can manually aim these once they're fired to correct and hit tanks on the ground. You can still just dumb fire them though, but I would recommend getting familiar with the keyboard guidance, as it really is worth it. I would also recommend the smaller B bullpups over the more powerful C versions, as the Bs will still do just fine, and you can take more of them. Its main negative though is the flight model. If you pull harshly, it does have a tendency to rip, so you do need to be careful. It's similar to the FJ-4B, also at 8.7, with worse flight performance, but better ordnance. If you have the money, you could consider getting the FJ-4B VMF-232 on the marketplace as this FJ can carry 5 bullpups, but it's currently 140 Gaijin coin, so I would not recommend it for that price, but I feel like I should still mention it. Either way, as always, I wouldn't recommend just buying the A4E with GE, although it's a competent CAS aircraft with a lot of potential, and definitely worth passively grinding for. 
Next, we have the Harrier, the AV-8C. On the surface, it's quite unassuming. You can take out five individual bomb drops or three bomb drops with Zuni pods. These are pretty big rockets that are great at splashing stuff. The AV-8 has CCIP for the bombs and rockets, so you'll get a marker for where they'll land, which really helps with accuracy. The Harrier isn't the most agile aircraft, but you can put up a fight and do have countermeasures too. But the Harrier has an advantage that's not regularly utilised or even mentioned. It is of course a VTOL, which means you can land on helipads, which not only lets you rearm closer to the battlefield, but also gives you an air spawn, so you can very quickly run back and forth and do a lot of damage. There is the premium AV-8A, which can do this too, but it doesn't have much longevity and is expensive. There are better options for premium aircraft here. Still though, the AV-8 is a gem. Next is the F-4C, and I recommend this one over the F-105 for example, because it's a fighter. Most of the CAS options you have around this BR are strike aircraft, so if you take two, the spawn cost shoots up by a lot. It is inferior to the F-105 for CAS alone, but its designation makes it worth considering. You can still carry a heap of weapons, you have CCIP all around, and can carry some big bombs. You can also take a few radar missiles for some easy drone kills too if you know some are in the air. It's heavy and can be unwieldy when fully laden, but it's a good supplementary option if you want to add more than one aircraft to your lineup. Next we have the A-10, couldn't get away without mentioning it. Despite its prominence in aircraft culture, it really can't operate if the enemy has counters up. It's very slow and weak, but if left alone, you can shred teams. You can carry mavericks, large unguided bombs, rockets, and even some AM9Ls too for aircraft. The premium version can carry guided bombs, the GBU-8s, though I wouldn't say that these alone are a reason to buy the premium version just for ground RB CAS. These aircraft are highly dependent on the vehicles the enemy has active, and since you can't guarantee you can use it to success or even spawn it in, I wouldn't buy the premium. The gun of course, legendary, you can decimate light vehicles and chew up MBTs if you can shoot through the roof, but in most instances you won't be able to get close enough to use the gun. Since the A-10 late can use the Mavericks with the thermal sight, your best bet is getting some altitude at the start and lofting the Mavericks to hit any active SPAA. Then you can potentially get in close with bombs and the gun. So slow, fragile, vulnerable, but it's still cool isn't it? I wouldn't say it's the best pick for Cass here, but it does have a lot of potential if left alone. Next up, we have the A6E, and I mentioned this one in a similar way to the A10. On the surface, it looks amazing, but most of the time it isn't too reliable. It's very slow, fairly sluggish, and can be countered very easily. Although, it can just as easily turn around an entire game on its own if you're uncontested. The A6E can carry a huge amount of ordnance, but overall it's best to go with the GBU-12 Paveway 2. You can carry some larger paveways, but they're not really necessary. The 12s give you more potential kills. It can be greater altitude for lobbing these down onto enemy tanks, but the issue is it's a $70 premium, which for a situational vehicle you sometimes can't even use due to lack of spawn points is way too much for me to recommend it it's too dependent on what the enemy have up. If you can get it on sale, it's still great situationally, but it's not constantly reliable, and I wouldn't buy it just for Cass here. Next is the only heli I'll be recommending for now, the YAH-64. This one is a squadron vehicle and basically just the AH-64A at a lower BR, 10-7. Unlocking helis right now is a slow process, spading them even slower. This squadron version is much simpler to unlock, and it's really the best fitting heli you can get. It's nicely workable, and at arguably the best BR. For the US, I much prefer planes to helis in general, but this one is worth passively grinding for if you're in a squadron. It's really the most approachable heli you have, packed with hellfires, a thermal sight, and the autocannon. Standard stuff really. 
Still, I wouldn't recommend buying it outright for GE, as if you are on a budget, planes will do great, and you don't need this thing. Either way though, I would focus on this one if you are after a heli. Up next, we have the F5E. This one is a very responsive agile fighter that can carry four mavericks and missiles. Its potential may seem quite low, but it's still very reliable if the enemy have aircraft up. Against aircraft, it performs great as it's so maneuverable, and can still strafe light targets with the twin 20mm cannons. You can easily get a bit of altitude, drop the mavericks, and then play a bit more aggressive as a fighter, depending on how many SAMs there are. I like this one. Unlike a lot of the more dedicated strike aircraft, it's less dependent on what the enemy have up, which is great as it gives you a lot more agency. And it's also at a great BR too, so I would really recommend it. Next up, we have the A7 series. There are a few of these, and we'll look at all of them. Starting out, you have the A7D at 10.3, a very competent attacker that can carry a load of Mavericks and GBU-8s, as well as large unguided bombs. For the BR, it's really nice. At 10.7 though, you have the E version. This can carry the Walleye TV guided bombs, which are great. You can equip five of these with a targeting pod, along with missiles too, which give it a lot of potential. It's still bulky, but just manoeuvrable enough to dodge some SAMs and take out some of the more sluggish aircraft too. It's a really strong pick for 10-7. Lastly, there's the A7K, which I don't really recommend, but would still like to mention. It's a lot heavier and less able to react to missiles, and it's also 11-0, so you can't use it to good effect in a lot of lineups. It has Maverick Bs, GBU-8s, and the same targeting pod as the E, so it can still do quite a lot, but it's not really worth going for, explicitly as it's an event vehicle that's currently 55 Gaijin coin. So I would avoid this one, but the D and the E both have a lot of potential. Next up, we have the F-16A. This is fantastic potentially. You need to be careful if the enemy are fielding any top tier SAMs and will need to stay low to take them out, but its loadout of Maverick Bs and GBU-8s are great on this platform. It's a very powerful fighter with a lot of agency to counter anything. There's barely any fighters that can give you trouble, and you still have the agility to hug the ground and take out anti-air. It's a really powerful option. However, it is 12.0, which means if you have it in your lineup, you are sacrificing ever being top tier in your 11-7 tanks. Which, if you love Cass, is not really a problem. This thing can easily turn games around once you get good with it, though it will take a while to unlock and spade. It comes after the F-16 ADF, so getting it will take some time, but it can be well worth it once you have it up and running. Finally, we have the F-14B. This version comes with the thermal targeting pod and paveways. It's still less agile than the F-16, but can drop these at high altitude to very good success. You do still need to be careful and watch out for enemy anti-air, but it's a very capable aircraft along with the F-16. A drawback of the Mavericks is that they always aim centre mass, so on a lot of Russian tanks, you often only end up taking out the driver or clipping the barrel. Paveways are a lot more reliable at taking out anything, so the F-14 and F-16 are great picks. There are a lot of nuances for playing them which I don't really have time to fit into this video, but you should definitely check out Cave and Amriki on Twitch. They have a lot of experience with these planes and can definitely give you a nice outline for how best to use them. So, finally we have our lineups. This time I'll go over them in a bit more detail and give some more options for each BR. I'll give each lineup two variants. The first one will be completely free to play, no extra crew slots, no premiums. And the second will be a kind of average, under the implication that you can have a few extra crew slots and a premium or so. So firstly of course we have 8.0, a nicely competent lineup with some good vehicles. Of course at the core you want the M60A1. It's probably the most versatile and consistently usable vehicle you have. It's very dominant in a down tier and can still perform in an up tier due to the stabilizer. It's definitely the vehicle I'd go with first. Then I'd go with the Bradley. 
Again, at time of recording, it is a struggle at the moment with the missiles, but even so, you're stabilised, have a decent autocannon, thermals, and workable mobility. It's a great second spawn, and can help you get into aircraft quicker. And hopefully in the future, the missiles will be more usable. Afterwards, I'd pick the T-95E1. It lacks a stabiliser and any sort of impressive mobility, which does hurt it beyond 8.3, but it's very strong around its BR. And the matchmaking at around 8.0 is fairly good, so you will get a lot of chances to use it. Next is a bit of a choice that depends more on you. For an SPAA here, all you have is the M163, which is okay, but not the most reliable anti-air. If you're someone that finds yourself in anti-air at the end of the match quite regularly, or enjoy playing it, it is worth putting it in, but if not, you can in some instances use the Bradley for this role, which then opens up a slot for the M60A2. The M163 is fine as an anti-air, but it's not very versatile. So if you're okay with using the Bradley as a pseudo anti-air sometimes, I would put in the A2 here, but I would still go for it last. So until that point, you can have the 163 in your lineup, and by the time you're able to get the A2, you've had the opportunity to run the Bradley and 163 a fair bit, and can then better decide if you want to ditch the 163 or keep it. For your aircraft, the F9F is what I'd stick with. For the second lineup, let's assume you can get two extra crew slots. I'd fill one of these with either the Starship or 163, depending on your choice. Then you've got one slot left. If you feel like you'll be sticking around here for a while, you could go with the M901, but only if the missiles do get fixed. It can be fun, but not worth the tedium right now. Instead, you could go with the F3D as another aircraft option if you like your CAS. You could though instead go with a backup like the M60 or M47 if you're not so keen on aircraft. Though the lack of stabilizers will hurt in the up tiers you'll face. Still, if you aren't really into aircraft, I would use one of these as a backup here. Next is a tricky one. You can potentially make a lineup around 9.3, but it almost requires the XM1 to be effective. So if you're free to play, I would just stick with 8.0 until you can unlock some later tanks. If you want to play here, I'd go with the XM1, MBT-70, XM803, and the M247, with the A4E as your aircraft. As backups, you can put in the Bradley, and then some other aircraft, or even one of the M60s. Generally though, I would not recommend this lineup. As we mentioned in the main part of the video, the jump from 9.3 to 10.3 is big. You start seeing the flood of Leo 2s and a lot more T-series tanks. It gets a lot more competitive here, and most of your tanks can't take the heat. Well, it's usually the APF-SDS they can't take, ha 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 ha. Anyway, unless you're really smitten by the XM1, I would honestly recommend sticking to 8.0 and using that lineup to unlock the later vehicles. If you're able, I'd definitely put a Talisman on the M60 AOS, and maybe even the Bradley or T95E1. Really turn it into a power grinding lineup. As I mentioned, I Talismaned the T95 and it served me really well. Although, admittedly, that was back when there was less competition for it, but either way, if you can, M60 as a priority. If you do avoid this BR, I would then also skip the M247 and go straight for the LAV. The grind for those proxy rounds is long, and you'll likely be replacing it quickly with the later stuff anyway. Next, you've got 10-3. Again, not a fantastic lineup, but it is a more effective segue into rank 7, at least regarding objective efficiency of the vehicles. To headline here, you want the Abrams, followed by the M3A3 and the LAV. Even if the XM975 is improved, I'd still stick with the LAV, as the Stingers are still decent, and you can more effectively use it as a light tank here. Next, you can either go for the Striker if you aren't put off by the stock grind, or the MBT-70. For the MBT, the gun won't be reliable, but your mobility and the 20mm will be. It's still only worth it as a backup, but it is the most reliable one you have. If you're not keen on either, you can still focus on aircraft. I'd recommend the A7D and the F4C. You can still go with the Harrier, but if you do, pair it with the F4C. Otherwise, you'll get hit with a spawn penalty for having two strike aircraft. The lineup does struggle a bit, as it doesn't have many versatile MBT options, so you may not have the best time on some of the more linear close-range maps. 
What really makes the lineup pop though is another Abrams. If you're able, you can have a strong one here with the previous vehicles and the KVT. I'd still also aim to get the Striker or MBT as more conventional backups. Still though, this lineup can be harsh in up tiers. So I would again still suggest sticking with 8.0 if you can get some talismans. It's the most consistent lineup you have in terms of up tiers and reliability. So it is good to stick with it, although it might get a bit stale playing the same thing over and over again. I would still recommend it as the up tiers in the later lineups won't be fun, but it really is up to you. 10.7 though is really where everything starts clicking. And right now, I'd say it's the best top tier lineup America has. I'd go with the IPM1, M1A1 and the regular M1 for definite. Then, depending on your preference, the M3A3, Striker, or an SPAA. Ideally the 975 if it gets changes. For your aircraft, if you can only pick one, I'd personally go with the F5E. It's versatile and I have the most fun with it. Though the YAH or one of the A7s will still work fine here. If you have more slots, I'd just fill it out with some more backups. Any of the light stuff we just mentioned or another aircraft. I'd personally lean more towards ground vehicles of this BR over aircraft though, as around here is when they generally lose a bit of agency. If the enemy has some powerful SAMs, you won't last long unless you play very carefully. Aircraft of this BR can be really powerful if left alone, but can also be taken out quite easily if the enemy has a counter. And since they're so expensive to spawn and can't control the map like ground vehicles can, I personally don't use them very much, unless I'm playing with friends and can coordinate with them. Finally, we have 11.7. Similarly, I'd go with the SEP and 1A2 as your backbone, and then go with either the HC or AIM, or even the IPM1. I still quite like the IPM1 here. You have much better mobility, a decent round, and an almost unmatchable reload. It lets you play in a different way, which is nice. After the Abrams, I'd go with the ADATs and one of the earlier CAS options. As we mentioned though, you can go with the F-16 or F-14 here if you really do like your CAS, but you forfeit ever being top tier for this, so it really depends if you enjoy using it. Personally, I do prefer being in tanks as it gives me more ability to control the map and cap stuff, but this is something I can't decide on your behalf. If you have some extra crew slots, I'd structure similarly definitely having the SEP, 1A2 and ADATs. Then it depends whether you want aircraft or not. If you do, I would consider the HSTVL here. Despite the inconsistent damage, it's great at getting into aircraft. Then you can get both the F-14 and F-16. For a final backup, either the IPM-1 or AIM slash HC will be fine. If you're not interested in aircraft, you can pretty much just take all of the Abrams with you, plus the ADATs and HSTVL. Although I would always take one CAS option, even if it's not your thing. You can potentially turn around a game with it, so it's always good to at least have the option. For top tier, I don't think there's much objectivity for lineups. The best thing you can do is structure a lineup that caters to your skill set, whether that's CAS, standard MBTs, or focusing on the light stuff. As long as you have a decent backbone of the Abrams, the rest is up to you. I don't really enjoy cast much, but some people can wipe out a team with it, so it really depends on what you like. Currently though, I would say 10.7 is where America's modern stuff is the most consistent and fun. And fun is really the only thing that matters. Above all else, play what you enjoy. And with that, I think we're just about done. Thank you for making it all the way to the end. You can now hear how awkward I usually sound when I don't have a script in front of me. Yeah, I always start these out by saying there's probably not much to say, but it ends up being the case that there's a lot to say, <laughs> inevitably. Um, but really, just thank you for watching. It's been a very long video, a very long time in the making as well. Um, so I appreciate you getting to the end and watching all of this. Hopefully it will remain as a accurate view of the top tier of America for a while. Um, I hope so anyway, but with this game and how it constantly changes, there's it's never going to be completely uh, accurate for, for very long. Um, but hopefully you can still kind of take the vehicles out of whatever situation they're currently in in the future and still, there's probably hopefully still some echoes of uh, how to use them in there.
with how uh, I think rank eight ground was confirmed loosely, I think in one of the last Q and A's. Um, so I imagine some stuff's going to get moved up to rank eight inevitably, and with some more vehicles and then premiums and that kind of thing. So there's probably going to be quite a few uh, changes in the future, but hopefully the video can still hold up for a while at least, or just be something you can have on in the background while you do other things. That's okay too, of course, I don't mind. But yeah, I all I want from this video is that it helps in a, in a small way for you to enjoy the game a bit more. Um, that's it really. I'm not too much of a fan of top tier as I mentioned, but I still think it can be fun, so get one of the premiums if you're able to and just have a fun time with it. Or just play any other part of the game you enjoy, really. That's what I'll be doing after this. This uh, <laughs> top tier session has lasted very, very long, and I'm quite looking forward to playing the rest of the game again in a more casual way. Um, I do know what the next video on the channel will be. I don't want to spoil it yet, but it is a very... Um, if you watch the streams and you know me, it's a very me thing to do, if that's any indication, so hopefully that's somewhat enjoyable as well when it eventually comes out. It will be another long one, but still hopefully something that's, uh, you know, worth uh, your attention for a while. I hope there's not too many errors in this video, as there's so much information and so many different things, there's probably like a couple of things I've got wrong, uh, but hopefully they're not too pivotal. Something I've realised that I do, which is quite um, annoying for this specifically, is that I really can't stand listening to myself talk. Um, which is quite uh, a detriment in this job, but also because I can listen to a segment of this video back like five, ten times and miss a very obvious error constantly because I am, as I'm listening, like tuning out my own voice. Uh, you can probably notice in some of the segments as well that I will use the same word uh, constantly because I'm just filtering it out of my brain. Um, I think there's a term for that, but I can't remember what it is. So hopefully it's not distracting and uh, you're able to listen to the video and just enjoy it. And yes, I will try my absolute best to make sure there's not as much of a gap between the next video. It will still take a very long time, um, but it's simpler to make in terms of maintaining information. Like in this video, I re-recorded uh, the segment for the Sheridan, I think, five times in total. Uh, because things kept changing with it. So with this next video, that won't be the case, and there'll be a lot more I can do with it perpetually, which is, is going to be nice, I hope. Um, yeah, I guess that's all there is to say. Just thank you very much for watching. I hope you liked it. If you'd like to see what I'm up to, I do have a Discord you can check out. Um, I'm always there, but I pretend that I'm not a lot of the time. <laughs> but I am, I am there. That's where I kind of exist uh, most of the time. Anyway, this video is obnoxiously long and I am just contributing to it in a way that's probably not that valuable at this stage. So let's uh, wind down here. I hope you're having fun with the game and thank you very, very much for getting this far with the video. And hopefully before too long, um, there'll be something else on the channel too. It won't be the standard uh, tier guide, but I will do one of those after the next video, so they haven't stopped. Um, I'll just pause one for one video. Anyway, I hope you've had a lovely day. Thank you very, very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.